I am the devil, and I am here to do the devil's work. They will say that I have shed innocent blood. What's blood for, if not for shedding? There is nothing to worry about. You're gonna be just fine. We all go a little mad sometimes. I like to dissect girls. Did you know I'm utterly insane? Have you checked the children? children. children. Stay on the road. Keep clear to the moors. Beware the moonlets. Hi, I'm Chucky. Wanna play? <laughs> I met this six-year-old child with this blank, pale, emotionless face and the blackest eyes, the devil's eyes. Who's laughing now? Who's laughing now? Now it's the after movie diner and a month of October. And they're watching horror films. That's why they call it Horror Tober. They're watching horror films, that's why they call it ah, Horror Toba, 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 ah, Horror Toba. Hello, I hope everyone is sitting comfortably, unless you voted for Trump or think guns are a good idea, in which case I hope you're sitting on a large spike rubbed liberally with hot pepper sauce. Welcome, if you can, to the second in our Horatoba series of podcasts, and boy do we have an exciting one for you tonight. Well, uh, actually we can't guarantee excitement, but we can guarantee length. This episode will most definitely have quite... length. Girth, or the substance, if you will, is up to the listener and not for me to presume. So please write to us at hello at aftermoviediner.com or leave us a voicemail over at 347-669-0053 or at speakpipe.com forward slash aftermoviediner and tell us how you found our girth. Remembering again that I'm talking about a film discussion and not some sort of collective penis made up from the members of me and my guests tonight. Talking about my guests, our first guest this evening was forged deep in the fires of Mount Trevor, a rocky outcrop somewhere near the Valley of Thighs, by a wizard known only to his close friends as Celia. He knows exactly which Dragon Ball Z characters he'd fuck, marry, or kill. He has a surprisingly in-depth knowledge of the cleavage of obscure Japanese cartoon characters, and he's so geeky and so black that he makes Donald Glover look like Danny Glover, who I'm pretty sure once <coughs> French-kissed Mel Gibson, who, as we all know, is a complete and total cunt squirrel. Please welcome back on the show your friend and mine, the guy who I try and use to assuage my horrendous white guilt, one of the three of the almighty three black geeks, ladies and germs, it's the legend, D. Shaw. Oh my god, I laughed so hard. Holy <laughs> shit. First off, I don't, first off, only I can name that wizard, that name. You're not allowed to use that word, you use that name, okay, sir? That oh, is my privilege not okay. yours okay. and second of all yes i can yes i can yes you can you know you know i can't i mean i'm sorry yes i can you know say who i fuck mary kill and everybody on dragon ball z it's actually kind of <laughs> easy i think mo- i think you can do it anybody can do that that's, that's i easy, can that's i can definitely do it yeah anybody I can, do that. Mo can definitely do it mo can definitely <laughs> do it that's really yeah, easy yeah. the challenge is the challenge the challenge for that is that actually still a moon that's when it becomes a challenge <laughs> He's not wrong. He is not wrong. So, wedged uncomfortably between D and myself is a man, well, what can we say that hasn't already been said? He can fart the national anthem of Belize. He owns 75 black hoodies all emblazoned with the famous actresses that he's done terrible butt stuff to in his mind. He once wrestled a silver black gorilla for his copy of an obscure and unreleased Todd Sheets movie that was so tit-heavy even the foliage had breasts. And his beard once solved an argument between Menachem Begin and an otter named Terence who was a staunch defender of Palestine. He rides a mean tortoise, plays an angry ukulele, writes a downright petulant game of Dungeons and dragons and has a huge warehouse in the antarctic filled with enormous rubbery dongs in case of an apocalypse where it's just him and heavily bushed playmates of the 70s left it's the one and it's the one my bro from a to the hoe it's a mosif porn gentlemen good evening yes yes 
<laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it's it's becoming really difficult, Mo, to outdo <laughs> all the intros that I've written for you in the past. Yeah. Oh, no. More so yeah. the book. The seventies bushes. I'm like, that's exactly what Mo wants. Yes. <laughs> oh yeah. No. 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 Yeah. No. So, yeah. I mean, the only thing better than a seventies bush is an eighties bush. Oh no. I'm sorry. The only thing as good as a seventies bush is an eighties bush. But as, uh, but as really, good. really only up to eighty four, and then they're just they just start getting terrible. Yeah. Exactly. And especially when you get to two thousand and one bush, which <laughs> we will talk about later uh, when we cover bad karma. Um, it's disappointing because it's just not as as grotesquely and or graphically huge as it should be. Um, but no, Mo and I go way back on the uh, subject of Bush, and we are firmly in the staunch 70s rug camp, I think. We, we, go, we, we go all the way back with Bush to the Bush era. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so that's fantastic. So how have you, how have you both been, and uh, what have you been watching so far for Horrortober? Go ahead, Dee, you can go uh, first. Um, well, you know, usually I don't, um, it's, it's funny, usually Three Black Geeks doesn't really go into any horror, but this year I decided, because we did it last year, um, we started to do actually more horror movies, and even, I guess, what you call Supernatural, because that's what we just got done. Uh, that's not even a supernatural. That was space aliens. Barely. We did signs. We just did, um, <laughs> that was space I mean, uh, it was more on faith and it was like terribly written when you really think about it, but whatever. Um, swing so, away D swing away. Yeah. Oh my God. You know what? Even if, <laughs> it, it, it was great because, um, uh, it was DJ Sue, um, uh, Eris. He didn't, watched the movie at all. He had to actually do something else. So it was just that me and lucky bastard. <laughs> it, it was That's just fantastic. me and Chris. I saw that fucking movie be... in the theaters. Oh, my gosh. You know what? i never seen only Shyamalan movie I've seen in the theaters was actually um, The Village. And I, that was probably the top three times I was, like, literally pissed off, ready to, like, punch <laughs> the person that gave me the ticket. That is one of the few times I've ever been really, really mad. So, so um, remember, as as... people, it takes a village to fuck D off. <laughs> <laughs> You know what? Here was the sick part. Here was the sick part. It was, it was, it was actually my best friend. Me and him was watching it. This motherfucker leans into me 15 minutes in. Hey, D, I think I already know what the twist is. Like, shut the fuck up. Shut the fuck up. So we get about minutes later, right? I lean in. He said, you going to tell me what the twist is. i like, I'm going to walk out this motherfucker if we find out. <laughs> if we find out that all this is taking place in present time, he said, that's stupid as hell. I just want to say, like, the monster was like some Scooby Doo character or some bullshit like that. Come to find out that we were both right and we were both pissed <laughs> off. <laughs> I, um, I, I classically predicted the twist from The Sixth Sense from the trailer. Oh, yeah, of oh, course. It, yeah, 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 completely. It, totally. Yeah, just Father fucking ridiculous. Same fucking thing. We was like two minutes in. He's dead. I'm like, what are you talking about, Dad? He's dead already. He's dead. That's yeah. Bullshit, Dad. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's I, already uh, dead. The, the only movie of his that I've ever enjoyed is Unbreakable. That's the only movie of his I've ever liked. Yeah, they it's, should. Although, they should, although, they should do something. Said, they should do a Shyamalan movie where he's really a dead superhero who is. At, it looks like it's in period time, but actually it's in modern time. <laughs> And he's, and he's having to fight the trees because they're really the villains. That would be the ultimate Shamalama Ding Dong movie, I think. See, I was going to say, I was going to say that the first, like, like, 15, 20 minutes of The Happening is amazing. Like, I went into that yes. thinking to myself, <laughs> shit, this might actually be a really good movie. And then it's the fucking plants. And I'm like, oh, you've got to be kidding me. And then Mark Wahlberg's talking to a bush. And... <laughs> And and not he's a like, good seventies time. Yeah, right, right. He's sitting, he's sitting there going, "Oh, hey, Mister Bush, say hi to your mother for me." You know, and it's yeah. just fucking fantastic. Man, it sucks. We we did that last year. Now we did, did that last year too, and it's funny. <laughs> I I said that Signs was my favorite one because out of of all the stuff he did, that was the only one I didn't really feel that was too heavy and all this. Then look at it again. I can't fucking stand it. But um, uh-huh. but now to me. It's the happening. The happening is my favorite because it's so fucking stupid. Yeah, the happening is like bullshit. really it's idiotic. So yeah, yeah. It's so stupid. It makes me happy inside. So I like that, and I like the other movie he made, Devil. I actually kind of like Devil because Devil was just as fucking stupid. Was that, the, was that the elevator movie? The the yes. one where they're yeah. all in the elevator. <laughs> that's 
Oh, you might as well call it the elevator movie. <laughs> God. He'd seen Lift and then gone, what if yeah, we right, make it? Right. Yeah, what if we just add the devil to it? And I'm like, really? The devil's going to show up in an elevator? All right, Shyamalan, here we go. <laughs> Strap it, it, in. It, it, it's going to be a bumpy ride, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> the, best, the best part about it was, was that Shyamalan did what most screenwriters do. They fall back on the Spanish person being into the supernatural more than anybody in the room. And he <laughs> the picked the dump- he picked the dumbest thing. My grandma said every time toast falls on the jelly side, that means the devil is like, what type of bullshit is that? <laughs> <laughs> did you just wake up and say it? It's like, yo, Shyamalan, did you just wake up and say it? All right, I just thought of something really, really dumb. This will be perfect for the movie. Is that what you did? Is Mo, that what you really did? Mo, I'm going to um, ask you something. You've got to picture this, right? You know, like riff tracks where they talk over the top of the movie and you can buy the DVDs and stuff, or, yes, or yes. Uh, Mystery Science Theater. I would love a series of movies where, and it's exactly the normal movie, but occasionally D pops up and goes, what kind of fucking shit is that? Like, <laughs> that I would pay good money for a it. whole DVD I, series of just D occasionally in the movie be like, Toast, are you fucking kidding me? Toast. It'd be like pop, it's like those pop, those old pop up video <laughs> things, and it's just D's head popping up. And going, you have got to be fucking kidding me. <laughs> oh, okay, see, that's funny because <laughs> me and all, me and all, Chris basically got to be part of the DC critics list. We got to get go, go to all the advances, right? So oh, we nice. actually went to see, um, what was that? Not Prometheus, the other one, the one that just happened. To, um, Alien, um, Alien, um, Covenant. We did Covenant, see Covenant, right, right, yeah, yeah. So. Oh my gosh! It, it, every so often, every so often, you would hear me and Chris. What? <laughs> <laughs> and it would make it so funny. It was so funny. We went to see uh before that. It was uh the Triple X movie, which good God, that was terrible. But um, <laughs> and I can normally stand like, Vin Diesel, but but I saw the first I Triple love X. Vin. And, I saw the first um, Triple X, and I was like. F- forget that um because i liked his like i loved the witch hunter like i thought the witch hunter was like perfect I, vin like diesel it. stupidity like i really enjoyed that <laughs> you know you know vin diesel actually did uh when the witch hunter came out he did a uh, a brief like one shot D D session with uh with one of my favorite online gms yeah. and it was and i mean it was fucking terrible vin i mean like the the man appreciates dungeons and dragons but he does not know how to play he's like right. he's just he's just like i'm gonna swing my hammer you know yeah and uh <laughs> it's, it's it's it was fucking ridiculous and he was playing like his witch hunter character yeah. for for the thing it was called um what was it called? It was called D and Diesel, I believe they called it. <laughs> That's so fucking Sam, stupid. That's that, genius. That actually sounds that sounds like a really, 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 really appropriate um porno title, actually. That really yeah, right? No, D, I was but, just but, gonna say, yeah. like if 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 Vin ever falls on hard times and has to do like gay porn to get out of the <laughs> financial slump, <laughs> it could it could be D and Diesel. That's what it would be. Like yeah. like Dick and Diesel. <laughs> yeah. It was so funny, but we was looking at Triple X, and, and um, this time it was different. It was like all like the audience. It was like you know, like it was like people that would come in for the screener, and then it would be the critics up top, and all the critics sat up top this time. So while you hear some people in the crowd, you know, just being like you know, just saying what I like to call trailer bait, like you know how they would show clips of people watching Paranormal Activity and they would act like they're scared. Yeah, yeah. They were doing that crap, like ooh, ah, awesome. And I forgot what scene it was. And before I can yell out what, it was actually my buddy. He was on the other end of the um, movie theater. He's like, what the fuck is this? <laughs> <laughs> so so I learned that, that, hey, that's my avenue. But yeah, um, outside of horror, and I'll just wrap it up like this. Outside of, um, of all the horror stuff we watched, we were watching um, the good anime called um, Helsing Ultimate. We're going to do that this year. Oh, we nice. didn't get to that year. I love Helsing. It's really good. My wife is in love with that whole series, so I know it front to back so it'll be great for me you know it'll be great to go through we um we're going to do the worst halloween movie in my opinion which is um halloween i think was it resurrection the one where it was um so fucking bad oh i hate that movie i hate that movie and i i remember i took my girlfriend to see that movie it's my favorite 
It's my favorite of the series. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> it's my favorite Buster <laughs> Rhymes movie, but... Uh... <laughs> fairly... No, actually, no, it can't be. I, I got I to gotta check what other movies Buster Rhymes was in, actually. <laughs> no, it might not be, but I'm just... with, <laughs> with, not... with Resurrection, they committed the cardinal sin, which was that they killed Laurie Strode. Like, I wouldn't have minded had they done an eighth one like, because at the end of Seven, obviously, he's decapitated and Laurie goes off and lives in the hills or whatever. Like, I wouldn't have minded if Eight was just, like, Michael in a totally different area and it didn't follow on the Laurie Strode story and they did the reality TV thing and whatever and blah, 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 blah. But tying it to the rest of the franchise and then killing Laurie Strode is, in the eyes of a Halloween uh, fan like myself, absolutely unfucking forgivable I mean, it's a sin. It's a sin. And I've even seen the director's cut of, uh, what was the one before, uh, the one with Paul Rudd? I saw the director's cut of that. I, um, God, um. Oh, oh that's you mean, you mean, uh, six. Oh, you mean yeah, six. six. Halloween six, which is the, there's a producer's cut. It's not a director's. It's the producer's yeah, yeah, yeah. cut. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I thought, and it's, it flows so much better. Loomis, uh, Donald Pleasance, which, yes, sir, I do have a love for Donald Pleasance. Donnie P. So, he, so much more of him in it, and it, 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 the flow of the story makes a lot more sense. Yeah, so I saw that. But um, the main one we're going to do for Halloween, well, at least our Halloween one that is going to come out on Hall- on the day of Halloween is going to be Candyman. And nice. holy shit, that that movie actually scares me. It's like one of the four horror movies that I really am actually scared of. So it's one of the, it's one yeah. of the few like I called it for a long time because I fucking love Candyman um, and I love it for I love it a because like you're right it's a really creepy sick scary movie that takes place unlike a lot of other horror films which always take place in the woods or like in the suburbs it takes place like in the in the city like in the city center in yeah. like the around the city which which is difficult to do because obviously like normally you have like tons of people around and it's not easy to kind of you know something like a maniac cop kind of gets away with it but not really there aren't many kind of what they call like urban horrors but Candyman is is not only like one of uh, uh, one of the few urban horrors, but it's one of the most successful ones. Um, yeah. And then, you know, despite all the other stuff that it, it says, but then there's also that awesome thing in the middle of it where the long haired, effeminate British guy who like talks to um, uh, uh, Virginia Madsen uh, around dinner table and he tells the story of the candy man, his like description of the story of Candyman and the way he speaks is to me a complete hilarious delight because he says things like they slathered the honey on his prone naked body like the way he talks is <laughs> fucking genius I fucking love him and he says things great, like great. he he made all his money by developing a machine for the mass production of shoes like I'm like what, <laughs> what the fuck is that going to do with anything? Like, I love that kind of detail. <laughs> it's fucking brilliant. I think, yeah, for me, it's, it, it is one of the... It, I only remember it because uh, I, the main thing I remember, I was like, um, God, I was in the fourth grade, maybe fifth grade when it came out, and um, everybody did the whole thing, you know, turn off the lights and say Candyman in the um, mirror, and during that time, that legit scared me as a kid, and then I saw the movie, and then it really scared me shitless. And um, yeah, and it's and, like a, it's like a proper like gory, grimy film yes, as well. It I mean, is. it the really bit, is. The bit in the hospital uh, where she's like like covered in blood, and they have to take her clothes off and inject her and do all that kind of stuff. Like that's genuinely just from a human standpoint. Forget the fucking horror element of it. Just from a human standpoint, that like makes your skin crawl and makes you feel incredibly sorry for her. But then like the bit where she's in the psychiatrist office and Candyman appears behind the psychiatrist, and the psychiatrist just starts spitting and pissing blood everywhere. Like that. That to me was like one of the most terrifying sequences I had seen in a film for a long, long time. It, it like is. I really, and it, it reminds me of, um, and I saw that not, uh, not too long ago, the first um, uh, uh, Nightmare on Elm Street movie, where mm. I, I will say it, it doesn't scare me, but when I see Freddy and the way he was, holy shit! <laughs> yeah, no, definitely, he was definitely really legit scary. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Freddy, Freddy is legitimately scary in only two. Of those movies. Yeah. Only yeah. two of the movies. Only yeah. two of the movies is really and legit scary. First yeah. one and, and New, New Nightmare. Nightmare. Thank yeah. you, Mo. God, and I New love Nightmare. you, dude. You know what? And Mo, thank you for that because I actually seen New Nightmare. When you told me to watch it, I 
saw it probably like probably two months or whatever, sometime later after that. And I was like, holy shit, that son of a bitch was right. You know that. that. Some, sometimes I'm right. <laughs> it ain't the stuff I was to write. You know what it was? It was sort of like um, how if you meet somebody and say, ooh, I like slashers, and they tell you to skip um, Halloween 3. It's like, no, fuck you. Watch that. When you were like, yeah, no, no. yeah, yeah, yeah. No, if somebody, tells you like... they, if somebody tells you they like slasher films and tell and then tells you to skip Halloween 3, then they don't like slasher films. Because yeah, Halloween don't. 3... Because, frankly, and I'm going to get a lot of shit for this and I, from the public, not from you guys, and I don't care, but Halloween 3 is the second best Halloween movie. Yes, it is. Yes, yeah. it is. You yes. Know? I love Season of the Witch. I, I like, And I hated it for a long time. And then I sat down and, like, because you have to get yourself out of the Michael Myers mindset for the Halloween, for Halloween 3. You have to look at it as its own movie. And as its own movie, it's fucking fantastic that i'll yeah. agree with i can't say it's my second favorite halloween movie it's because i favorite. because i don't really think of it as a halloween movie meaning halloween the franchise right. um right, right. like it's one of my favorite horror movies like it's one of my favorite tom atkins movies it's one of my favorite like horror ideas um yeah. but it's not like of the Halloween franchise, I always remove it because I always go by, and I've said this multiple times, but I always go by one, two, and seven is the Laurie Strode story, and then four, five, and six is like the knee story followed by like the man in black kind of story. But like the, the, I always think of those two trilogies, and that's really where I kind of end with the Halloween franchise. Right. Um, well, it's, so, the same, it's, it's the same thing with, with Nightmare on Elm Street. Like, honestly, it, it's, it's one, three, and new Nightmare. Right, you know, and while I appreciate two, it's not a great movie. No. I was going to ask you that because yeah. I like two, uh, but no, I, no, I do like it. I do hate. like it, but I, uh, but it's like like two is is fourth on the the ranked list, so to speak. I understand, I understand yeah. that because I, I feel that same way about um but literally uh, everything else. I can I just pass. I just skip on because I don't care for them at all. I kind of feel that way with the. I feel that same way with the Jason movies. Actually, I never ranked the Jason movies. Honestly, I, I think there's only two Jason movies I actually like, and that's Jason Takes Manhattan. <laughs> and... <laughs> Everybody likes that movie for all the wrong reasons. Yeah, of course. I like and, the, and Jason I like, X. Actually, and Jason X, of course. I like. I like uh, Take Manhattan only for one reason, and I feel as though that I'm alone in it. I love the deaths in that movie. Yeah, I love the, the depth of that movie so much. The the I think right the biggest problem with the Friday the Thirteenth franchise is how it got more than any other horror franchise out there. It got edited to shit by the studios, and a lot of that footage um, of like cut death scenes and things either wasn't shot, got lost, or um, is only in like work print quality. And they don't, Paramount don't want to pay to have it like uh, put back on a 35 and then digitized onto like Blu-ray or whatever. Because I think if you didn't, if you had all the kills in the Friday the 13th franchise in their truly intended special effects gore heavy way, then it would be a much better kick-ass franchise than it actually is. No, like I always, probably right. Yeah. I always it feel is. like if, if you look at seven, right, which is a really great idea, like Halloween, um, Friday the 13th part seven is basically like Carrie versus Jason. And it's a really great idea, but all the deaths in that movie, of which there was meant to be like a triple decapitation, and there's the bit with the um, sleeping bag, and there's the bit with yeah. um, uh, bending the guy in half, and a whole bunch of other stuff. All the deaths in that have been like edited out and neutered, and there's no kind of full version out there. And I think that's where that franchise really falls down. Because once you yeah. start to get to like um, a nine uh i know people hate nine but it's where you first start getting like real gore and effects back into the franchise because it's um k and b effect and then once you get to like 10 and he's like smashing people's faces that have been dried in nitrogen and stuff like and they're, and they're <laughs> don't fighting. try to say that too quickly don't try to say that too quickly <laughs> no but like once you start smashing people's faces stuff there's real gore in it like the deaths get really like the, that franchise kind of takes off again but unfortunately it takes off at the end of the franchise when it's really sort of run out of any actual ideas of a storyline um and that's the shame like four is probably of the entire franchise four is probably the strongest film in terms of start to finish cool deaths interesting characters and like 
cult, goofy, weird, funny bits with uh, Chris, Crispin Glover and. Um, with, yeah, I was say that's the one with Crispin Glover. I forgot which one. I thought that was the fifth one. Yeah, thank you, thank you. That's yeah, the yeah. that's the one I like the most. Yeah, that's, that's the one that, I like the most. That's a good one. But like, apart from that, uh, uh, and maybe like bits of seven, bits of one. Uh, and maybe bits of ten. There are and, and like the Manhattan bits of actually Manhattan, um, which I still claim. Like I still claim, Jason takes Manhattan is a better movie than people give it credit for. If it was called Jason on a Cruise Liner, people would have gone in <laughs> with much better expectations because people go in with the expectations of him hacking sways through fucking Times Square and up the Empire State Building. That's the thing I hate it. He did that last year for uh, Halloween, too. And we was like, so he took Manhattan, guys. Like, took what? What the fuck did he take? The only thing he did was kick a boombox and killed a couple of people that was on the same cruise ship as him. He didn't take nothing. Well, now that he's taken Manhattan, now he needs to take Berlin. Right. (laughs) (laughs) So anyway, guys, we're 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 a few minutes into the show. So let's um, move over to Mo quickly run down. What you've watched so far in Horatoba. <laughs> and then I was going to say, now that we've, we've talked for a half an hour, do I get to answer the question? Yeah, you uh, no, no, I, listen, it's a, it's a Halloween Horatoba episode, so we should be talking horror movies. And right, really, right, right. I don't know how much we're going to have to say on the three films that I sadly picked and I can't apologize enough for. That's, so, that's mo- totally fine. Uh, <laughs> honestly, honestly, so far, my list is very sparse because uh, I've literally watched the three movies we're going to talk about tonight and i watched terror vision um that that i'm covering uh on a future episode of the projection booth uh which which we recorded last night actually um and who knows when it's going to come out but uh but that was super fun um (laughs) i love terror vision like it's just such a ridiculously fun stupid hilarious movie um and I don't think it gets the credit that it really truly deserves because that movie is subversive as shit. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's great satire and uh, and has some like and, and like and one of the other guys uh, uh, who was on the show had pointed out something that or it might have been Mike. One of them pointed out something that I didn't even notice. And I've seen this movie a million times and I've never noticed there's no swearing and there's no blood in the entire movie. It's like, you know, it's like, and and like, I sit back and I think about that, like, holy shit, you're right. Like every time somebody goes to swear, it's like, it's some weird, you know, distortion of like, like a weird fifties swear. Right, right, right. Uh, You know, and, uh, and the blood is always green or blue. Like there's no actual blood. It's so it's like, it's like they were going for like a PG 13 on this movie that involves an alien coming to earth and eating everybody. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's a great, that's a great fucking movie though. Terror vision. Everyone should check that out if they haven't already. Absolutely. Um, we haven't done an episode on it, but um, wasn't it packaged on a Blu-ray with the video dead? Wasn't that yeah, a double yeah, bill? Yeah, yeah no, cause we covered the video dead. So uh, terror vision, we haven't covered, but that's why it was in my, my mind because of that. And uh, in terms of what I've watched, apart from the three movies uh, we've seen tonight, uh, I also watched um, Prom Night 2, Hello, Mary Lou, whatever it's called, which I've covered before on the show, so I won't go into that, but it's a damn good movie. If you haven't seen it, check it out. Um, uh, and... The first one was better than me. The first one was better than me. Yeah? You don't like all the fantasy sequences and the Michael ironside of the <laughs> sequel? <laughs> Look, look, here's the thing, here's the thing. I didn't say nothing wrong with Michael Ironside. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with Michael Ironside. There's if a anything, lot wrong he's... with Michael Ironside, but not in the movies, no. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot wrong with him, but not in this movie, no. Right, right. I, always say that when, I always say that with Michael Ironside. He either kills a movie or he's the only one, he's the one that's, like, truly saving the movie. And that one is kind of a little bit both for me. <laughs> so I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I still, I still can't get over it when it comes to, like, early Canadian horror that he was in, I still can't get over him and his little leather pants in visiting hours, so I have (laughs) a real real difficulty getting past that image uh, of a greasy Ironside packed into some leather pants. uh, (laughs) A greasy Ironside. He is, man. He's so sweaty in fucking visiting hours. It's it's grotesque. 
Uh, you know, I can actually, I can actually think of a movie though. There is one that comes to mind that he's not. He, he's both. Ne- or he's neither a detriment or the person carrying the entire movie, and that's Turbo Kid. True. You yeah, know, yeah. That's you know, a good he, point. He, yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's fine. He's you know he he's uh, uh, amazing in it, but like the rest of the the, the actors are are perfectly you know suited to their roles, and 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 he's not terrible in it. So, oh no, he's just, awesome in that just, movie. Just popping that out there. Um, and then the other thing, because uh, uh, Kim was a really big fan of The Conjuring, so we went and watched the sequel, which neither of us had seen, uh, The Conjuring Part 2. And people know that I, I'm not normally like a huge fan of uh, like ghost horror or doors banging or whatever. Like I just I have no fucking time for any of that stuff. The Conjuring I did quite enjoy. Like it was nice. It was set in the 70s and like it had some stuff going for it and it was good. How much, I mean, how much Bush? <laughs> not enough uh, for my taste. Vera Farmiga did not reveal um, her 70s bush in quite the way that I would have liked. Um, but uh, but someone hangs himself from a tree, which is like a big bush. So, um, but no, they, <laughs> the, the first Conjuring was fine. I, I did enjoy that for what it was, although I can't say that they... It, it, those kind of films are ever kind of scary to me. It's not really my thing. No, I, I understand that. The, I, the, I hate... I hate how this last generation of horror movies were pretty much nothing but jump scares. The jump movies. scares, right, right. And the thing is, that was interesting to me about The Conjuring 2 in its, in its sort of failure for, for my particular uh, taste was that um, the tension that it built up certainly towards the first half of the movie with some of the sequences and some of the things, especially when it was like dark in the house and they were just using the flashlight and the girls didn't know what was going on and there was possibly a Ouija board and the girl was possibly seeing something that we couldn't see and stuff like that. There was like some nice set up tension. And what I always thought was crazy was when it actually got to like the jump scare, when it actually got to like the payoff of the tension, it was like the jump scare was never as scary as I thought it could have been. Like I found the whole thing like depressingly sort of PG. Do you know what I mean? Like there was no, um, like there was plenty of occasions where the payoff to the tension could have been like a really grotesque, sick thing that could have really like jolted you out of your seat or at least been a payoff to the tension. And instead it wasn't like, instead like a fucking chest of drawers flipped over or, you know, someone flipped up on the ceiling or you know like even even <laughs> the bit where I the, what you're talking about. it reminds even, me of a insidious was the same way i thought insidious the first one did a lot of really good tension and it had a decent payoff but i know what you mean why where you say it could have been it could have been something a little bit more grotesque or a little bit more scary i do it i know exactly what you mean by that and that and and i I hate that. I hate that too. I really yeah. do. I hate it. Especially, my- especially when they actually take the time to set up tension. You know right. what I mean? Because a lot of horror movies don't like doing that. Yeah. And my, my whole thing was is that um, if you're, first of all, they seem to be pushing the story. Like, this is a real story and this is what really happened and these are some of the things and da 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 da. Like, they seem to be pushing the story pretty hard. And my feeling was if you're going to push the story really hard, it has to be, the story has to be therefore more interesting than there is an old man possessing a young girl and then, oh, wait, actually, it's a demon possessing the old man that's possessing a girl. Like, there has to be more to it than that. You know what I mean? And um, the, the, it, 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 you know, it very quickly kind of shot off the rails of any kind of truth or any kind of basis in whatever the original story was and just went kind of wild and stupid with it. And then, you know, you had this idea of this really cool, like, creepy nun demon. And instead, all you did was like, oh, it's a nun, but she has like CGI teeth and black eyes. And I'm just like, well, I've kind of seen that a bazillion times. Like, do something exactly. really grotesque with a fucking nun demon. Like, fucking have mad... Like, think of, like, Henrietta in Evil Dead 2, like, with the fucking mad, crazy, wrinkly, floppy tits hanging out and a mad, scary face. And, <laughs> like, you could really go fucking nuts with, like, a, a nun demon, and then what you give me is, you know, oh, a creepy shadow and some CGI teeth. I'm just like, come on, guys. Like, you're not even trying at that point. And it, and it was just a shame. Plus, it was too fucking long. It was like two hours and 20 minutes or something. And I'm just like, no, no fucking, Ugh. no fucking horror movie. I don't care what the story. I don't care if it's based in truth or not. I don't even, like, I don't care how many fucking 
tabletops you flip over or kids you fly on the roof or old men with dribbling faces you have. Like, nothing can last that long because at a certain point, Kim and I looked at each other and we're just like, they got to get on with this. This is boring. Well, that's, that's, a, that's a big problem with, with modern movies in general is that I feel like modern editors have forgotten how to edit, you know? Um, and, 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 that's a de- and, and not to defend... Not to defend the editors that you're bashing because I I agree with you, but sometimes it's not them. Sometimes no, no, I, under, I understand. You can tell that. when I... it's obviously the fucking studio. Right. You can tell right. when it's obviously the studio or the producer trying to tell them no, take that out because we had a focus group, or take that out because we're trying to make this PG-13. You can tell, and I fucking hate that. Yeah, right, yeah, right. Yeah. But, but, just, but even really on top start. of that, though. But even on top of that, though, like you know, like especially with horror films, like horror films should be 85 minutes long. Right, you know, like yeah. a, a, just a tight yeah. run, run through exactly. the fucking story, s- slam in as much horrific visions of death and destruction as you can, you know, splatter around, you know, copious amounts of blood and gore, and and then call it a day and leave the audience wanting more. When you go on for two and a half fucking hours, it's just like by the time you're done, everybody's gonna walk out of that theater being like, I never want to see any of these fucking characters. Ever again. Yeah, no, exactly. And especially if the characters are all, especially if you're watching a horror movie and the characters are already shit characters that you don't care about. Yeah, which, you know they, almost I mean? always, which they almost always are. I, I almost just kept, always are. I just kept watching this going, I would really fucking dig a hard uh, eight, 80s version of this story, like with practical right. special effects. And you know, mad seventies hair and crazy sound mad effects 70s like Bush. mad seventies Bush, and and <laughs> like uh, you know, with with a, a, a Raimi or a Carpenter or someone directing, like I would totally go for this story. It wasn't that there wasn't something there to make a horror movie out of. It's just that nobody involved knew how to make a horror movie. Like it really was just <laughs> Except, I, I hear that. disappointing. So I anyway. Hate- Talking about disappointing horror movies, uh, <laughs> let nice us, segue. Nice segue. Uh, let us move over to the three uh, movies that I'm really sorry, gentlemen, but I picked uh, for this particular episode. Let me explain myself very quickly. Um, yes, explain yourself, ex- John. Ex- explain yourself, <laughs> you John. Ex- explain. So explain I, where you just <laughs> and I said when I'm sorry and I had to say this, John. I was say, I was telling myself when I got to the last movie, I think it was Bad Karma, uh, and I wrote it to you. I was like, I hope John was standing up when he pulled all three of these movies out of his ass. <laughs> I really do. Yeah, otherwise it would have got really painful. Um, no, the the <laughs> uh, I was standing up. No, I forget how I, it came across my mind, but I was like, oh. Jack the Ripper movies, but, like, the American take on them. I I kind of just... I don't know how that came into my mind, but it did. And I was Googling Jack the Ripper movies. I think it was sort of like... I was looking for... um, Like, those old, great kind of detective horror films. You know what I mean? Like, I was looking for some, like, detective horror thriller kind of things. And then I was like, well, Jack the Ripper's always great. There's a couple of good ones, like Sherlock Holmes and Jack the Ripper, I think, with, like, Christopher Plummer and... um, (laughs) James Mason. <laughs> and then you're like, David Hasselhoff, we got to watch that one. <laughs> right, right, right. So then I start Googling like Jack the Ripper movies. And the first one I come across was Terror at London Bridge, which has David Hasselhoff in it. And I was like, wait a minute. There's an 80s movie set in Lake Havasu in Arizona with David Hasselhoff fighting Jack the Ripper who traveled through time in a bridge. This has to be point, uh, in our favorite thing of all time. In a brick. In a brick. This has to in be a seen. Brick. In a brick. So you know I saw when I when I saw the synopsis, I again. said the fucking in a brick. Altogether now, in, in a, a, a brick. brick. I the, when I saw the synopsis, John, I said, I'm sorry, the Hoff, yeah. Jack Ripper. This can't be good. I mean, I, well, now I say it, but back then, all right. This will fail, but it would be a good fail, and I will have fun with it. Right. Mm-hmm. So, so no. that was my so God, that was, no. <laughs> so that yeah, was my I, first. I, yeah, thing. yeah. No, me, me, and me and Dean need to need to hash this one out because I really enjoyed this one. Actually, I think I think 
well, I think we all probably enjoyed the same one the most, but this one, but but we all have differing opinions on the other one because I think <laughs> all of us liked two out of the three, right? I, I like I like <laughs> yeah. this film because it was directed by E. W. Swackhammer, Swackhammer. Yeah. <laughs> and, then, and stars someone called Randy Mantooth. Randolph, <laughs> Randolph Mantooth. <laughs> I had to look that person up, and I'm shocked as hell that that person is actually still acting today. He's a character actor. Who fucking knew? <laughs> Dorothy <laughs> Mantooth is a saint. <laughs> make another Dorothy Mantooth out for a nice fish dinner, and I will never call her again. <laughs> I, but, uh, but I love this. I actually really, really loved Terror at London Bridge. Like, like I even uh, recorded uh, a, a segment of the movie and posted it to my Facebook. That is, <laughs> the, it's the greatest cinematic transition of all time. So just a little backstory. Hasselhoff is a cop with a troubled past. A you cop know? from the dark <laughs> streets of Chicago. <laughs> of He's a he cop is. on the edge. Yeah. Um, but but yeah, so uh, apparently he accidentally murders some fourteen year old kid with a <laughs> <laughs> with a with a sharpened with a sharpened fucking can opener yeah. <laughs> that he thought was a gun, and yeah. he has this really really intense emotional scene with the uh, female uh, lead of the film whose name I don't fucking remember. Not um, not Adrian Kramer. Bar- oh, uh, is that Stephanie Graham? Yeah, that's Stephanie Graham. Or uh, Kramer, whatever her name is. And uh, you can cram her if you like. Cram her her as much as you like. (laughs) And so so he's like crying, you know, like he's straight up like crying to her. It's like, like, he was only 14. (laughs) And it's some of the best acting in the movie, um, which is not saying much because it's a fucking terror. There's no good acting in this movie, except for (laughs) except for Adrian Barbell. Um, well, she's only good acting because you're looking at her going, Adrian, how are you acting wearing those dresses? I mean, yeah, they right. had put her in the worst fucking clothes imaginable. Yeah. I mean, this is, she's, this is a, like, she's wearing librarian frocks the whole time. It's fucking ridiculous. I don't know what but, salvation... What? Wait, 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 hold, 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 before I get cut off, before I get okay. cut off, I gotta, Sorry, fin- I gotta finish the transition. Okay. I have to finish this. Okay. So he's so he's crying to her, and then immediately it smash cuts to this... <laughs> Ants party scene, you know, and like now I didn't show the whole thing. I because just the smash cut to the dance party is enough, but it pans across, and then it's like the two of them <laughs> stepping away from the dance party is like, man, you really cheered me up. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. So, it was like it was like the director. It was like the director was like, okay, okay. You know what, David, you're doing too much fucking acting. We gotta speak this. <laughs> All right, everybody dance. Everybody, everybody <laughs> fucking dance now. Every, everybody dance now. So, so let's let's uh, let's back it up. That is one of the greatest moments in the movie. But right, like, right, let's, right. So let's back it up. So first of all, the <laughs> names in this movie are incredible. We, we we've already said like E. W. Swackhammer and Randolph <laughs> Mantooth, but you also have Clue Gulliger, which is just, has has a fantastic name of, of Return of the Living Dead fame, of course. Right, right. Got yes, Ken, it, yes, it does. Ken Swafford, which is. <laughs> phenomenal name david fox brenton i mean some barbara bingham like there's so many great like mad names in this movie david fox brenton is one of the most british names i've ever heard in my life yeah exactly <laughs> and he plays mr latting um and rosemary who has a normal name plays an alma belcock <laughs> So, like, the, even if you don't have a silly name in reality, don't worry, the writer's given you a silly name. That's how well, this it's, movie it's, works. It's the ZZ Top principle, you know? Like, you're either named yeah. beard, you either have a beard or your name is beard. <laughs> right, exactly. Exactly. So, that's the first thing. The second thing is, like we've said, Jack the Ripper has escaped to Arizona present day in a brick, which in makes a brick. no sense. <laughs> But apparently when a, a a clumsy tourist, what, pricks her finger or something? Like, I don't even know how she pricked her finger. Like, I don't know where that I don't came know where from. I think, she, like, fell, I think she, like, fell forward and her, like, her palm was bleeding or some bullshit. That's one it's sharp like... brick. <laughs> <laughs> so her blood drips on the brick. The, it then expa- her blood then expands to cover the brick, and then Jack the Ripper li- literally inflates <laughs> from the brick, <laughs> which is Mo, just hey, Mo, Mo, well, you well, and I watch, you and I watch, watch our fair share of anime. 
Sure. And even I said, what the fuck was that? <laughs> <laughs> I got a question. See, 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 it was bad enough. It's bad enough when you look at um, Charles play and for whatever reason, and um, Chucky always is attached to the doll for whatever stupid reason they say. And it's like, okay, fine. That's stupid. How did that work? At least there's like some magic there. When? When did Jack the Ripper say, like, I don't know, Kali Ma, Kali Ma, went to the brick? <laughs> none of that, like, none of that shit happened at all. Oh, of a no, sudden. no, yeah, there's, no. There's, no ex- there's no explanation to it <laughs> at all. No I, mean, I was in a library watching it, and once again, I do my trademark getting loud when I see a movie. I <laughs> loud fuck was that? And like two people beside me was trying to look at what I was watching. <laughs> Did I just see a man inflate out of a brick? I don't even know. <laughs> like, that's who... the best way to describe it, inflate. That's the best way to describe it. Yeah, yeah, it's totally, it's totally mad. And it was, it was, I have to say, like, of the three of them, this one I far enjoyed the most. Like, I just enjoyed watching this one the most because it didn't, I wanted, like, David Hasselhoff in his 80s prime with his shirt unbuttoned to the navel, trying desperately to act and say dialogue with his ridiculous hair and his stupidity, and I got all of that and more versus Jack the Ripper. Now, is is it a good movie? No, of course it's not a good movie on on any level at all. But it was, of the three that we watched, it was the one that I had the least problem enjoying, if that makes any sense. I don't know. I didn't like it at all. I didn't like it at all. There were parts in there, of course, the smash cut, and there were some... (laughs) List mo- moments in there where it was, you know, okay. But what I always say is if I'm watching a bad movie and I know it's a bad movie and I'm trying to enjoy myself and I fall asleep, then yeah. that's why I don't like it. And I fell oh, asleep, yeah. and unfortunately, I fell asleep watching this movie. And I and I hate, I did hate myself for it, but at the same time, I was like, well, I didn't enjoy it, so <laughs> I can't get see, too mad. See, <laughs> see th- this isn't the one that I enjoyed the most. I enjoyed the one we're about to talk to talk about next the most, but this is the one that's mo- that's the most consistently entertaining through the whole movie. Because, like, how did you? I'm sure you guys didn't know, and now we all do that. Lake Havasu has a horror museum that has a meat locker attached to it. <laughs> right? <laughs> you know what? That's an interesting. <laughs> yeah. We all needed to know that, Mo, and now we do. Now um, we do. But no, it was. It was what what I loved what I loved most about this was all the like it was someone came to the writer William F Nolan and went here's some fucking whacked out idea for a TV movie uh, write this will you and what he did was he threw every single cliche from every single genre that he could possibly find. And let's not forget, like, this is the guy who wrote, like, Logan's Run and Trilogy of Terror. Like, he's written some good stuff, right? He's written good shit, yeah. Mm, so, uh, but what he did was he went, okay, I'm going to basically get throw all the fucking cliches in here. So, I really enjoyed that. Like, I really enjoyed that, like, Hasselhoff was playing, you know, this cop from the rough street of Chicago that has, like, a, a dark past where he killed a kid and he came to Lake Havasu and now he's hunting down Jack the Ripper, and he falls in love with the local girl who owns a boat, and da-da-da-da-da. Like, there was all this stuff. Like, and and what was... Oh, by the way, on the point of him falling in love with the the woman who, by the way, totally should have been swapped roles-wise with uh, Adrian Barbeau. Like, I can only assume the reason why Adrian Barbeau is killed so early, and that's not a spoiler because it's on the fucking back of the VHS case for anyone who Googles Googles this. No fucking bullshit. Um, but like the reason, the only reason I can imagine Barbo dies early in this film is because once she got to making it, she was like, I'm going to take this other character that dies early. Cause get me off this fucking shit <laughs> as fast as I can. <laughs> Especially once she saw her wardrobe with the fucking little house on the prairie fucking shoulder poofs. And the, like, it was ridiculous what she was wearing and but she would have been so much better as the main character because stephanie kramer was as bland as all get out but um what was what i want to ask the women listening there are no women listening but what i want to ask the, <laughs> the, the fictitious women listening is on their first date hasselhoff lies about having grown up fishing right because he goes out on her boat with her to fish oh, that and was he hilarious. Knows, knows nothing about fishing 
whatsoever. So the, on the first day, he lies flat out to her. And on the second day, admits that he is such a bad policeman, he can't tell the difference between a gun and a can opener. And because <laughs> of that idiocy, he shot a child and killed him. So on the first day, he's lied flat out to you about something he really doesn't need to lie to you about. And on the second day, he's admitted to <laughs> homicide of a child. What? Why have you not run in the opposite direction? Like, well, you know, but you know what that, that, but you know what that means, you what. But you know what your that means, though. Right but, you, but, <laughs> but, your... <laughs> but you know what that means, though, is if that's the first date and that's the second date, then obviously there's going to be sex on the third. <laughs> right, of course. <laughs> it can, it can you only... Think about it. It you can... have to think about it. If you survive those two dates with this man lying <laughs> to me, and then and the second time he has mur- he has murdered a child, <laughs> murdered a child. So for the third date, you have heard the worst. At this point, how big your dick is? That's no, no, the only no, thing no, you no. have to. Think about. <laughs> on the That's third the only... on the third yeah. date, which isn't really a date, he shows up at your house in the middle of the night and tells you because he went to a library, he believes. Not a Jack the Ripper copycat, but the Jack the Ripper from 1888 is back in Lake Havasu killing people for real. And he tells you this at two in the morning, sweating profusely with goggly Hasselhoff eyes. At that point, you'd, you'd have the dude locked up. You're like, wait a minute, you're a killer? You're a liar. And now you believe that Jack the Ripper is back to get you. Yeah, let, let's lock this guy and his fucking velveteen pants right there. in a fucking meat Right there, locker. that's what you go to his captain. Uh, captain, I got a question. Have you did a psych evaluation on this, this motherfucker? For real. This has to be... Uh, there- Tied up in the basement of his house. There has to. Be. <laughs> oh, oh, you know, you know what actually just hits me, John. It just hits me. There's a reason why, why I kind of scoffed at the movie early. There's a bit of a Jaws type of subplot they got going on. We can't stop this. We were like, where the mayor comes in and says, yeah, you can't yeah, cancel yeah, yeah. the day. Like, yep. really? Did all movies in the 70s and 80s fall back on the eat, on the mayor being selfish? Did we always do that? Yeah, so this is, the, the, that's my other point, D, right? Like, the, the writer has just crammed every fucking cliche he can find into this movie. So, <laughs> Lake Lake Havasu and has London Bridge on it, which is true, right? Like the London Bridge was shipped over to one of the lakes in like the southern Arizona or southern California, somewhere down there. I don't know if it's Havasu itself, but like it's definitely down there somewhere. Um, and uh, they're having a reopening ceremony because they found this lost brick. So it's the last missing brick, <laughs> right? It's you, the last brick. And they've said it's such it's such an important brick. They've sent someone. <laughs> from San Francisco to cover it. You can imagine the front page of the San Francisco Chronicle be like, fuck who Zodiac is. Did you find out they got a brick back from the Thames? Like, what the Man, fuck? I have, they found I'm, a brick at the bottom of the Thames. We, we've yet to find Zodiac, but don't worry, everybody. We found the brick. So, <laughs> everybody, so anyway. everybody, I know what you're saying. I know what you're saying. I know what you're saying. There's this AIDS epidemic going on in San Francisco right now. <laughs> But there's a fucking brick that we found. <laughs> we these found... motherfuckers found. I, I... <laughs> these motherfuckers found a brick. In... <laughs> <laughs> like, no, but, hey, Don, Don, listen to me, Don, Don. You have to listen. Look at what I wrote. Holy <laughs> shit! What page now? <laughs> brick found. So anyway, so yeah, yeah that's, Lake... the, that's the headline. <laughs> brick found. <laughs> so, 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 Look, you say brick found. You see one of the uh, minor uh, stories underneath. Fifty people, fifty people burned up in a car crash. <laughs> Good lord! Uh, but anyway. I, I do. I do want to mention one of so the no, other. No, 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 let me let me just so, so let me just finish the, the train of thought about the oh, mayor sure, 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 sure. So. Uh, they're having this rededication ceremony or whatever for the bridge. Everyone's come down. It's tourists, tourists, tourists. And on the first night, one of the tourists is there. They, they get killed by Jack the Ripper. Um, because, like we say, they bro- bring Jack the Ripper back to life with their finger Because blood that- brick. Because, <laughs> yes. Because brick. So uh, that happens. And then all the way through the movie, you were saying about, like, the, the chief and saying to the chief and stuff, which is played by Clue Gulliger. Um, the hilarious thing about it is that is that Hasselhoff does no detective work, has a history of shooting children, 
Um, <laughs> and, and the mayor and the mayor's office, the politician guy, Lane Smith, the guy from the uh, office is Lane Smith. And Lane Smith keeps saying, like, you're fired. We're taking away your badge. We're taking away your gun. Everything you're doing is wrong. Like, blah, 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 blah. You've got nothing to show me. Fuck you. And he's the shouty one. And then Clue Gulliger as the chief, even though the chief does not outrank the mayor in any way at all, keeps going, I'll give you another chance, Hasselhoff. Oh, you think the real Jack the Ripper is doing it? All right. Follow that lead up then. Like, he keeps getting chance <laughs> after chance after chance, even though anyone else in their right mind would be like, take your perm and take your tight jeans and <laughs> Fuck <laughs> off. You know what? You know what? I gotta say it. I have to say it. Man, this white privilege is fucking killing me, man. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Let me tell me. Let me get this very fucking straight. Let me get this really fucking straight. I, I, the thing, is, the thing, the, the thing is, the, is I think that with Hasselhoff, it's more orange privilege. It's like Trump. It's I more it's, orange yeah, privilege. It's, yeah, it's more orange <laughs> pri pri privilege. Also, also, would you say no to that perm? Would you? <laughs> Would no, you? not really. <laughs> no. So I, I want to I wanna, I wanna mention real quickly one of my favorite aspects of this movie is that the because we were, we were talking about how the writer threw all of these terrible cliches at. Let's talk about the red herring in this movie, who, which is probably one of the worst red herrings I've ever seen in a movie ever. You know, so you well, get this it doesn't guy. make any sense. It doesn't make any fucking sense whatsoever. This the guy doesn't this make guy any sense. What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> this guy, what has he been hunting fucking Jack the Ripper for fucking 300 years now? Okay, tell me how does that make any sense? <laughs> it's like, 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 he just shows the fuck up. Just a random British guy in the middle of Arizona just shows the fuck up, and, you just... <laughs> and he's creepy as fuck looking, you know. Like, and they and they never really explain him ever. He just kind of shows up, creeps everybody the fuck out, is right about everything that's going on, you know. And then like, what happens? Like, like they, yeah, like they either capture him or kill him or something, you know. Oh my god! And then meanwhile, you've got this like this this hoity-toity little, oh, hello, hello, you know, uh, <laughs> cutesy guy who's ob obviously, like, the second they introduce the second British character, I'm like, okay, so the happy-go-lucky, you know, handsome guy, clearly the killer. Just fucking clearly. <laughs> and, of course, he is. Yeah, I mean, I didn't even think that was a twist. Like, I didn't even, I, I didn't I, even know... I didn't even know that's what they were going for. Because I saw the first English dude and was like, well, he's Jack the Ripper. <laughs> like, I just... <laughs> what, what? <laughs> oh, so you fell for the red herring then. <laughs> no, I saw, uh, the, I saw I... the pretty blonde uh, one. Who, by the oh, way, was the I worst... The interesting... Yeah, he's fucking terrible. He was the worst Jack the Ripper <laughs> of any of these three. Of he's even... three, yeah, he's the worst one. <laughs> yeah. Even though I still say this is the best film out of the three of them. Like, this is the only one that I would watch again. Oh, my gosh. I'd watch this. <laughs> and that's what you call white privilege, D. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Got me there. <laughs> we like it, D. What are you? Because, <laughs> D, D, I'm like, I will watch this again, and there's nothing you can do about it. Privilege. <laughs> right, <so. laughs> yeah, take, take all the uh, take all the knees you want. We're watching this again. <laughs> no, no big deal, man. You know, it's, it, it's just that I didn't enjoy it. I thought I was going to, and I had and on I had paper. So on paper, this this should be a movie that any like weirdo film fan should enjoy. But I could definitely understand understand why somebody wouldn't. I mean, it's a piece of shit. <laughs> I mean, really. And D, I, I have totally had that experience where people have either sung the praises of a movie or said, oh, I had the best time watching this bad movie or, um, you know, wh whatever it is. Like, I've had plenty of people say that. And then I've sat down to watch it and gone, I have no idea what these people are talking about. This is a piece of shit. <laughs> So, yeah, John, John, I but totally in, fair, get that. In, in, in fairness, John, that is because you're a contrarian dick. <laughs> <laughs> hey, see, see, Mo was going to say that shit. I wasn't going to respond to this. I respect you, John. Yeah, I respect you. He, he would say that, not me. <laughs> I, only, I only say it because I love you. <laughs> exactly. I only say it with love on the surface and deep-rooted hatred and jealousy <laughs> in my cold, dark heart. <laughs> 
<laughs> so, uh, Dee, <clears throat> Dee, did you have anything to say? I think Joe, um, I think Mo and I both kind of like enjoyed it for its own kind of goofy sense. <clears throat> and I would also say that I thought, weirdly, for a TV movie, it was kind of nicely gory. Like, it wasn't super gory or anything, but like, you saw throats being slit and. You know, yeah. there's the blood on the stone yeah, and stuff like that, blah, blah, blah. Which and I was actually respect, surprised by. Yeah, in that respect, that is kind of surprising, you know. That is surprising. You see that level of violence, especially for, I guess this movie came out, you know, I forget what year. What year it came out? 80 what? Um, uh, 85. God, I don't know what year. 85. 85. That, yeah, that's pretty graphic for 85 just for a tele- television movie, too. Um, the You know, at least with the violence they had in there. And yeah, I like I can appreciate some of the stuff they had, and you know I can, but it just bored me. It yeah, bored no, me. By the second that. time, by the third time, he got to Clue Gulliger and told because we heard David at least three times explain. <laughs> <because Yeah. laughs> that's, what I, I, that's what I knew the movie was in trouble because he had to explain the whole thing. Like, okay, somehow. Jack the Ripper is alive and nobody fucking believes him for good reason but still he had to explain it three times and I was like oh son of a bitch just in just in <laughs> yeah no I mean listen I'm not I'm not going on record as saying like this is now my favorite B movie ever or whatever I just thought that um, for as flimsy a premise as it was it delivered enough things for me that I was like, oh, okay. But I totally understand how uh, if I was in a completely different mood when I sat down to watch this or if, like, this caught me on a day when, like, I wasn't necessarily concentrating on it, whatever it is like that. Or just in general, if it didn't, if I just didn't enjoy it because I found it boring or whatever, I totally understand, like, people getting that from it as well. I don't necessarily want people to listen to this podcast, run away, find this movie, watch it, and go, what is John talking about? This is bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> like, don't watch it. Like, you don't have to watch it. But uh, I want everyone to watch this. Yeah, Mo wants everyone to watch it, and I think everyone is probably going to get what D got out of it way more than what I got. out of it. Oh yeah, absolutely. But I still want everybody to watch it. Right, <laughs> and you can watch now for four ninety nine on Amazon Video, uh, or just ask Mo, D, and me, and we'll send you a copy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, but yeah, if you do watch it on Amazon Video, don't forget to click through the banner uh, on the AfterMovieDiner.com um, because then every time someone watches Terror at London Bridge, I'll get a cent. So that'll be good. <laughs> uh, but if if D has nothing else to say on the matter, uh, let us move on to Edge of Sanity. <sighs> oh uh, my gosh! If if the last one was boring to me, this one was just ultimate batshit crazy and it almost got me kicked out the library because there were tits involved. <laughs> I love that you watch these movies in a library. Like, I can't tell you how much I love that you well, did that. Well, because my laptop is my laptop has zapped out on me. I have no fucking choice. So, right. so I had to watch the movie somewhere. No, but it's just so funny that you were watching, like, Edge of Sanity. Like, Terror at London Bridge, all right. But, like, Edge of Sanity, from the beginning to the end, is filled with just mad mid-80s Anthony Perkins, like, brightly lit sleaze. <laughs> I mean, just sleaze from start to finish. Yeah. It is. This yeah, was a- yeah. Really, really, you know what, if if they, if they the, if the if the first movie was like, okay, well, that's kind of riffable. It's really something you would see on uh, MST3K. This one, this one comes on, well, is a movie that comes on like twice on like Cinemax. Skinemax, yeah, this is a total Skinemax yeah. film. Yeah. It's almost Skinemax, really. And it's, it is, and then all of a sudden you have Anthony no, no, Perkins. There, there is a scene where a woman gets masturbated with a cane. This is yes. Skinemax. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. But here's the sick part. Here's the sick part. You have the fucking gall to have it be Anthony Perkins, and I have to. And as as weird and as sick as it was, here's me. No, Anthony Perkins is actually acting circles around of what I really thought he was going to do. Yes, <laughs> oh, no, he's fantastic in it. He is he's absolutely fantastic. fantastic. Like he's like the- like I think he was so method in doing this film that he was actually smoking crack. 
Right. Oh, yeah. He, yeah, he had to be. He had to be. Because I thought at least twice, like, okay, Anthony Perkins really did kill a hooker. He did. At least, <laughs> at least one. God he forbid has, it was he a woman. So many, he has done so many movies where he kills transients and hookers and stuff <laughs> that I guarantee you in real life he has killed more than one. Yeah. He is definitely, just just from his method acting alone. And what's what's also funny is, like, I understand like how Anthony Perkins got his name and uh, in in movies through Psycho and da 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 and all the rest of it. But like at a certain point in the eighties, he just goes, "Well, I'm going to do Psycho two, then I'm going to do Crimes of Passion, which is where he plays like a incredibly sexually repressed priest around like hookers and stuff, um, where he like fondles a lot of vibrators and goes mad. Like it's a completely weird <laughs> fucking movie. And then. <laughs> that movie i never got to see it psycho (laughs) psycho three like does it actually mo i forget but doesn't he actually kill someone with a vibrator in crimes of passion like isn't it like some like it has been way too long since i've seen that i i I can't answer that i have a feeling and i forget whether i'm right in this or whether it's just some mad ken russell bullshit in the (laughs) movie but i've got a feeling that i remember him with like this metal vibrator covered in blood like sweating and cursing and maybe i'm completely i don't know i haven't seen that movie in like fucking 15 years but but still the fact that you said that anthony perkins kills somebody with a vibrator yeah (laughs) no no but this is what i'm trying to say is is, a whole lot of thoughts in my mind like huh i wonder what i'm going to hear when i get on that podcast later on tonight (laughs) (laughs) killing someone i did not see coming (laughs) So what's incredible is through the 80s, he does that this way. He does Crimes of Passion, which I just mentioned. He does Psycho 3, which obviously has like a lot of like psychosexual uh, uh, sleaziness and weirdness and death and whatever in it. Like there's a lot of like. Oh, um, wait, hold on. Here, here, here you go. I got to cut you off for a second. Crimes of Passion. Uh, stabbed in the back by a razor t- tipped dildo slash vibrator. So, yes, there is absolutely a vibrator death scene. In Crimes of now Passion. I have to watch it. <laughs> no, <I have> <laughs> um, actually if you look it up that that scene is uh, presumably I, I can't click on it because we're recording but uh presumably that scene is on youtube so yeah no i would definitely uh, it, it just they just did a blu-ray of crimes of passion i think of course they did uh <laughs> of course they did so he does crimes of passion which is all like psychosexual nonsense with priests and things like that then he does psycho 3 which is like has a lot of like norma bates trying to find love again but really it's like weird and sleazy and sexual and killing people uh then he does destroyer uh which i can't remember his role in destroyer is there any like sleazy psychosexual stuff in destroyer possibly right i've never seen know. it I don't know. Okay. Uh, but I think he plays, uh, probably yet again, he probably plays like a, a kindly old guy who really uh, molests and kills people. I'm just going to assume. I don't know. And then Edge of Sanity, uh, he plays, uh, even as Dr. Henry Jekyll, because it's a Jekyll and Hyde story, but quite cleverly, I thought, they went like, well, if he's when he's Mr. Hyde, how about he's Jack the Ripper? So he becomes like I Jack the Ripper Hyde, which is actually kind of like a, a, a cool idea. The problem I have with this movie is they do absolutely fucking nothing with that other they than, do like... do nothing with it. Thank you. They, they do, do nothing, nothing with any of it. it. And it's funny. It's funny. This is not the first time I actually heard somebody had that same setup of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde where, where um, Hyde was actually the fucking... was Jack the Ripper. That's not the first time I heard this. So... And people have done that in their own type of um, fan fiction themselves. And I think it's several like books. They have done the same thing too. So right. I was really actually like, okay, I kind of like this where are we going to go. They went nowhere with it. Well, they went nowhere. nowhere. With it. They didn't examine like, cause uh, very, very quickly for people who care. And I would strongly suggest <laughs> that you, you don't care. Cause of all the movies weirdly that we watched, although this was by far the best made, had the best score in it and had the best tits in it, all the rest of it. The 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 this was the film that I actually had the biggest problem with in terms of like it not being what I hoped it would be. Everything this is else, my favorite. <laughs> every everything else, like like uh, um, the the bridge one was like completely adequate for what I was expecting from it. Um, <laughs> and uh, Hell's Gate slash uh, Bad Karma was kind of worse than I was assuming, but like 
pretty much where I was expecting. This one, on the other hand, I had high hopes for based on the way it looked, based on the way Anthony Perkins was acting, and based on the plot they'd set up. And it actually really doesn't deliver on any of the things you want it to. It kind of teases you that it's going to, and then never actually does. But essentially, the plot is this. Uh, he's Dr. Henry Jekyll. He's doing some work with anesthetics um, and mm-hmm. anesthesia and stuff like that. Um, and uh, one night with his monkey uh, has an accident. <laughs> <laughs> he's playing with his monkey. Do people, do people go to his- <laughs> yeah. While his while his wife is upstairs, Anthony Perkins uh, goes to his laboratory or man cave, plays with his monkey, has an accident where lots of white substance blows everywhere, and then he becomes a mad rapist hooker killer. Um, oh, so so this is an allegory about masturbation then? Yeah. Well, not a rapist. He's not a rapist. Sorry. He's a sexually he's a sexually repressed molester and killer because he doesn't actually ever have sex with the people and that's kind of the problem um and and the setup for the fact that he is so sexually repressed is that when he was a kid he was spying on two people having sex in a barn uh while one woman cannot fucking stop laughing which just drives oh, that me absolutely through awful. the wall oh, yeah. the movie. and yeah. um when he accidentally falls down from the top of the barn uh and is hanging by uh, a rope um the guy stops having sex with a woman and then like beats him, uh, beats the kid. He spanks him. Spanks him, like, repeatedly, which is kind of weird and obscene, and the girl's laughing, and then it cuts to a dream sequence where the girl has blood all over her face, and he's being spanked, and da-da-da-da-da. And it's just, like, constant debauchery, and then he wakes up as a, as a doctor, and uh, off he goes. Um, and anyway, the anesthesia turns him into uh, Jack the Ripper Hyde. He goes throughout uh, whorehouses of London uh, killing prostitutes, and that's it. Like, they don't examine um, the sexual repression kind of thing at all. They don't examine the whole being addicted to the drug thing and, like, the two halves of him trying to, like, get him off the drug or keep him on the drug or anything like that. There's some thing in the middle of the movie where apparently he runs out of the drug, but he turns into Jack Hyde anyway. So, like, now you're meant to think, well, okay, he can never stop doing this. There's sort of some stuff about him and his wife that actually goes nowhere. Like, and then it, the movie ends, and literally nothing has been either examined or resolved. So, th- although it has some interesting uh, visuals, and although it's full of just, like, sleazy crap... Um, it never really delivers on the deaths the way I wanted to. It never really yeah. delivered on the sleaze quite the way I wanted to. And then it ends and nothing so, happens. So that, that's how I was kind of disappointed. So, so what you're saying is that it is a near-perfect Skinamax film. <laughs> right, exactly. Oh, my God. He's right. It, it is, is like a near-perfect Skinamax film. <laughs> Nothing's resolved. Yeah, like, I, I got to really tell you, cool. as as a big fan of those ridiculous late-night Skinamax, Skinamax movies and – I like those movies way more than I should be admitting. The, right. I, this is my favorite of the three. Um, I don't give a shit that nothing is resolved. I don't care that they don't go into anything. I don't care about any of that. It's just pure debauchery, you know. And like, like I mean, think about it this way: like one of my favorite movies of all time is this movie that's called Just for the Hell of It that has no fucking plot line whatsoever and basically just involves a ra- a gang of rowdy teens destroying shit for 85 minutes you know <laughs> and and it's just set piece destruction set piece destruction there's a scene where they put a baby in a trash can why who cares it's a baby in a trash can it's hilarious <laughs> you know, it's the entire the entire movie and this movie reminds me so much of that just although this one's a little more focused in that like he had like there's a plot of sorts, you know, um, but that's all it is. It's just r- raunchy scene after raunchy scene after crazy psychosexual nonsense, you know. And it's just, I mean, to me, this is as as a fan of those late night Skinamax films. This is a perfect movie. <laughs> well, the, 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 the director has done other. The director Gerard Kikuin. Uh, has done other stuff like this. Lady Libertine is one of them, uh, which looks like a softcore French effort. And the other one, which uh, uh, hilariously has um, uh, covered up the nip... Like, they've put a naked woman on the front of the video box, but then covered up the boobs with stars. But, like, on the video box. And that one is called Flesh and Fire and stars Kevin Bernhardt. 
So if you like this one, Mo, maybe like, I feel check like I've out. Seen, I, I feel like I've seen that second one. Check <laughs> out. It's either, called, it's either called <laughs> Fire Under the Skin or it's called Flesh and Fire. And it looks very much uh, in the same um, cock vein uh, as Edge of Sanity. Wah, wah. But I, I do think, so what you're saying, Mo, is if they change this, uh, if they change the characters to something like uh, uh, Henry Cockle and Jack Off Hyde and then change the name of the movie to, I don't know, Edge of Labia, you would prefer it more. No, 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 no. I think it's perfect <laughs> the way it is because the, because the best the best Skinamax ones are the ones that take it way too seriously. Right. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. like, like when, you, when you're trying to make a a softcore porn parody they're terrible they're everything about them is fucking awful i hate like i mean like i don't particularly hate porn parodies sometimes they're hilarious but i i feel like like it, it when you take the the material super seriously and it's nothing but ridiculous like sexual drama and like thriller and stuff like that um it just it just makes the movie that much more enjoyable, and I I feel like Edge of Sanity did such a good job with that. Um, while, like you said, I mean, and I'm not disagreeing with anything you guys said. This movie goes nowhere. It does nothing, and it accomplishes nothing, but in a perfect way. It it's, it's, be, honestly, it's the it's a psychosexual Michael Bay film. <laughs> <laughs> it could be the fact that. That nothing is resolved is why I'm kind of mad. It's not. It, it isn't that the fact that you know at the end of the movie he killed his wife. You know, big deal. But I mean, well, if everything you say is like, well, fuck a big deal. We knew that was going to happen. But right. it's kind of like, okay, that was it. Wait, wait a minute. Why is the credits going? Fuck you mean that's it? Something happened? Oh, come, yeah, 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 wait, yeah, yeah. wait, wait, wait. So, come back here. Come back here. There must be more movie. Wait, wait. Give me, yeah. uh, it's, it's it's like, give me, so give me 15 more movie. minutes. Give me 15 more minutes. Just resolve something. I was just really I was just really thought like like when the when the, the police officer left him, right? And I was thinking to myself, like, well, he got away with it. Then just out of nowhere, bam! Scott the yard, get on the ground. I thought it was gonna be something like that or some bullshit. No. Nothing. Zero. D, Nothing. I hate to, I hate to stop flipping off. I hate to break it to you. No one in Scotland Yard has ever said <laughs> <laughs> Scotland Yard get on the ground in like such a rough manner. They they probably came over and went, uh, excuse me, w- pardon me. W- w- would, you, me good, would, you, would you would you put that cup of tea uh, down and possibly come with us? <laughs> I'd imagine, I know I'd, I'd imagine there'd be a couple there. of pip pips in there somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> would you possibly pip pip put that cup of tea down and and come with me? What 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 what? Would you mind? What? Would you mind awfully if I put handcuffs on you? It's really just for the TV cameras. <laughs> it's really just. You know what? Um, there was one I'm terribly, part. I'm terribly sorry, but yeah. You know what, Bo? Bo, what? I'm actually ashamed. Of you. I'm actually ashamed of you because I thought you would actually say the best part of the movie for me. The best part of the movie was actually the first time he turned into um, Jack the Ripper. Is when he's with the hooker and Abby Perkins bends the girl over down on on table. He rips her. He, he lifts her skirts up, skirt up, and he's nose to ass with her. With yeah, he's, he's yeah, he, yeah, that's there's some serious ass worship in and this I film. Said yeah. myself, and I said to myself, okay. I'm 34 years old, and I get to see Anthony Perkins eat ass. I have lived long enough. And then he stands up like, you son of a bitch! Go for it! Just go for it! <laughs> Just bury the nose right in there. Just do it. I thought he was. Oh, my gosh. I really thought he was, man. No, yeah, see, man. That's, that's, that's too graphic for what they were trying to pull off. Although, oh, he not, do, although he does masturbate a woman with a cane, so who knows? Hey, man, hey, at least we got something. <laughs> <laughs> Which was oh, we scene. Got, oh, we got plenty. No, the the best thing was like after he killed that that woman, and the guy came running upstairs to the rooftop where he had like his carrier pigeons or whatever. Oh, the, with a, the, the dandy fop. The, oh. the the pigeon had some blood on it, and the, and the guy was like, <laughs> "No, no!" Like that I was like. <laughs> I was like, wait, 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 wait. What was even better about that scene was the fact that not only was Anthony Perkins, <laughs> Anthony Perkins was mastur- using a cane to uh, masturbate, you know, to help the woman masturbate. There was a guy watching through the curtains, like, oh shit. Right. <laughs> yeah, I was, was thinking about 
first off, if he starts jer- if the guy that was looking through the window, I was, he starts I was jer- absolutely off, expecting him to start yeah. with yeah. I was waiting for that. Oh, they all, oh. all three of them should have, because Anthony Perkins was masturbating at the same time as well, as he was masturbating the woman with the cane. The guy in the window, had he started jerking it as well, like that, you're right, that would have at that point reached a level of like filth and sleaze that I would have actually stood up and applauded. It never <laughs> quite oh, got there. Oh. I was so ready for it. I like this movie did it. It crossed the line <laughs> for you. And it was the 1980s. Holy shit. Yes. It did a, it did a twi- triple wankarama and yet it didn't. It fell short. And I was very un- unhappy about that. Also, uh, even though we presume uh, Perkins finishes off, there was uh, no cum shot. And that, <laughs> for me, is unforgivable. Um, <laughs> But the, <laughs> that was the problem the whole. But that was a whole problem the whole time. Every time he's with what, me, not enough he's, cum he's, shots, <laughs> yeah, not enough ropes no, of arcing jism. <laughs> come on, come on! It's Anthony Perkins too. If he would have jizzed, it would have been the best <laughs> acting jizz you have ever seen. It would have been. It, like, it would have been a Shakespearean level cum yes. shot. Absolutely, it would have done. The cum would have come out in slow motion, and as it. As it as it arched past the camera, you would have just heard it in like perfect Lawrence Olivier, just have gone to be or not to be, dear boy, just as it like flew past the camera. You went, oh, you need, like I said, you would have heard that as, as, as the jizz passed the camera. I remember when I was a young sperm, not too long ago. <laughs> Now you're yeah, making just, me I like the movie it, more. I just imagine that now I'm imagining this this puddle of, <laughs> of cum on the ground, looking up at the camera and saying, "Hello, good sir," <laughs> <laughs> having a conversation with him. Oh, it's a bit cold out here. It was much warmer Ooh. where I was before. Um, but no, <laughs> <laughs> like so, uh, it, it 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 was to me like the, the other problem was is that like I've seen some Ken Russell movies, so like this one, which was very kind of. Um, can we do Ken Russell, but like on a low, like on a very low budget, um, and, and not artistic at all. I mean, I'm not a big fan of Ken Russell at all. I think he's a lot of hype and no trousers, but like this particular, um, movie so desperately wanted to be Ken Russell, which is kind of mad because Perkins had just worked with Ken Russell on, uh, Crimes of Passion. So it's kind of weird that like he would then go to this movie where this French guy, I presume, Gerard Kikoini or someone in French of, of of some kind of derivative. Um, uh, yeah, in France. Uh, you would have thought that, like, Anthony would have said, look, can we stop trying to do Ken Russell? I just work with Ken Russell. Can we do our own thing? But uh, he didn't. So the other thing I was going to say about Edge of Sanity um, was that it was one of the few movies that, while it attempted to be set in a period, so in other words, like, they wore period dress and right. um, he rode in a coach and horses and whatever and lived at like 221B Baker Street by the looks of it. Um, what was hilarious about the movie was it couldn't have been more 80s if it tried. Like it was so <laughs> fucking 80s. It was ridiculous. Uh, yeah, I, I got a huge kick out of uh, like, like, again, you know, uh, period piece clothing. And then you've got like hookers walking around in neon pink clothes. And, and you know it's interesting. I was going to ask that same question, like what was going on with the style? Because it was clearly the eighteen hundreds, but then all of a sudden it turned like into mid eighties fashion. I, I didn't. Well, know you know, what you know what it is. It's a lot. It's a lot like when they when they when there was that that time period where they took all of those silent films from like the twenties and thirties and like set them to like uh, synth rock, you know, music and. Uh, <laughs> And, and, and painted them over with all these weird neon colors. Uh, it's the same idea. <laughs> everything's yeah. everything's in a period, but still eighties. But what's you what's know, crazy I, about I, it I was that it. Anthony Hopkins was uh, uh, in period dress and everything at the beginning of the movie as the Doctor. But like when he became Hyde, he essentially became Mopey Spider Man, and he went out and uh, <laughs> he went out amongst prostitutes who were all dressed like Papa Don't Preach era Madonna. Every single one of them. <laughs> he Thank turns into know. a he turns into a much less cool Udo Kier. Yeah. Well no, no that's <laughs> even that's given him way too much credit. Like there was no <laughs> where near anything as cool and or as sleazy as Udo Kier. Like Udo that's... Kier could sit in a beige suit in a beige room and be more sleazy, more <laughs> menacing, and more problematic than this movie. It's true. 
Oh my gosh! It all they did with uh, I like how when uh, Anthony Perkins every time he turned to uh, Jekyll, he, I mean not Jekyll, I mean Hyde. He were all, it was like all they really did was just like, um, <laughs> pretty much yeah, make him like I can pretty much tell that Anthony was like no 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 I must I must go into this correct someone give me a crack pipe quickly. <laughs> <laughs> Like, I can really tell that he stayed up for, like, four days straight smoking opium. And then he's like, you ready for the movie? Yes, I am. Let's go. <laughs> I, I fucking love, I loved, like, the first time he breaks out that glass pipe and, and lights it. And I'm like, oh, come on. Is he seriously smoking crack now? Like, he's seriously smoking crack. Yeah. And, oh. yeah. But it was, it, but he, Anthony Perkins must have spent... The whole of the 80s bathed in, like, bright blue, bright pink, and bright green lights. Because, like, <laughs> this this movie, Crimes of Passion and, and Psycho 3, are all lit the same way. They're all lit as if the yeah. director of photography had just fucking watched an Argento marathon and was like, oh, yeah, let's get some pinks and greens up in this, mother. You know, like, that's... <laughs> That's kind of like how all these movies... And then the fucking Dutch angles. There wasn't a shot in this movie that wasn't on a fucking Dutch angle. And it was like... It, it, it really made me appreciate... Like, when you see either a, um, a Hitchcock or a Raimi or someone do, like, a really good Dutch angle or a really, like, weird shot, it makes me appreciate, like, just how fucking talented those guys are. Because when you right. see it done badly, like in this movie... Where there's no reason for it. It's just like, oh, let's put it on a slight angle because that'll add, like, what, weird menace to it? I don't really understand. Yeah. Like, it just brings into glaring relief just how good other movies are and just how bad <laughs> this one. <laughs> you know what? You know what? They had a beautiful chance to do something really deep with the character, to really go into how, you know, the sexual oppression and even on to the same level of Hyde acting out on it. It was, and I can't believe I'm saying this also, it's when Anthony Perkins had his hand hovered above a dead girl's ass. <laughs> <laughs> True. Wait, that, was, that was the only bit in the movie where they even tried to show him wrestling with it was his yeah. hand hovering above a dead ass. Well, yeah. no, that, that's, yeah, that's big. No, it's not, not entirely true. Like there is a scene where like the woman has her tits out and, and he sort of like backs off from it. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, they, they, they it very vaguely, you know, a, a couple of times in the course of the film show that he is struggling with this sexual repression. Um, but you see, I don't like any of those scenes. I much prefer the scenes where he's, where he's the ripper quote unquote, and uh, and is just reveling in it. Yeah, where you he's know, moody, where he's moody Spider Man dancing with uh, Kirsten Dunst in a <laughs> Spider Man in, in an old restaurant. That's what he is, but that's what he looked like. You and know, I, his, I like it, how he, I like how he becomes like a beatnik at the end of the movie, like when the wife finally finds him, and he's I'm like like I. <laughs> Like, like I was having, I was having, uh, like flashbacks of Rick Ocasek and Pia Zadora in, uh, in fucking, what is it? Hairspray, <laughs> you know, where, <laughs> where Rick Ocasek just puts his head through a fucking painting, you know, like I was getting those kind of vibes, like the, the way over the top bullshit beatnik nonsense. Man, you know what? It was so funny. I thought to myself, I, it, when he went, um, he was in the whorehouse and he started throwing chairs around. I just said you know what, that's not the first time Anthony Perk has done that inside of a whorehouse. That is not the first time that has happened. No. And it's and I'm pretty sure the directors and I'm pretty sure the director said, uh, cut. Fuck no, it has a cut. Roll it. It just started throwing. <laughs> uh, yeah, it was it was just like to me it was it wasn't like a parody of um uh, Skinamax movies, to me, it was like a parody of Ken Russell films. Like, that's just to me, like, it was just like, oh, yeah, let's have her dress up in a nun's habit and rub her crotch next to a crucifix. Because, like, <laughs> it, it just all seemed so, like, it was like a, you know, Pasolini movie or something. Like, they just tried to do, oh, let's do the psychosexual religious thing. And it was all just sort of done, like, half us. Like, and I just, you know, if, you, if you're going to go there, Mo. Get like strings of topless nuns, fucking gag bagging. Well, and I and you know I agree I mean? with you entirely. <laughs> like, look, I'm I may I may love, uh, I may love stuff like this, the the old Skinamax shit, 
but it's nothing compared to like old nunsploitation films, you know, uh, like, I mean, I'll take Satanico Pandemonium or fucking Alucarda over this any day. Like that sort of stuff. I'd much rather watch that. I'd much rather watch fucking Bava films or, you know, or uh, like Bacchanalis. Uh, what's what's this? What's that movie called? Uh, like Bacchanalis Sexualis or whatever it's called. You know, like I love like sleazy Italian bullshit. But, you know, I, <laughs> but <laughs> mo porn. I love sleazy Italian bullshit. That's your yeah, byline. That's, <laughs> that's yeah, exactly when I die. I want that. Ri- I, you know, I want that. I want a list of things I loved written on my tombstone. You know, he loved 80s teen sex romps, the Golden Girls and Italian sexual bullshit. You know, right, yeah. Uh, yeah, no, personally. absolutely. See, first, I thought you were just going to have, like, a mural to the, like, the um, Golden Girls, like, right on your tombstone and nothing else. <laughs> I, I want them to paint it on my forehead before they put me in the coffin. I, I actually uh, think, like, he would have, it would be the Golden Girls on his tombstone, but all their faces would be replaced. It would look like the Golden Girls. All their uh, uh, faces would be replaced um, with uh, Klaus Kinski, and then underneath nice. it would just say, "Thank you for being a fiend," and that would be it. <laughs> like that exactly. would be my my yeah. thing to Mo because that to me would say Euro psycho sexual madness, right. the Golden Girls, and a Werner Herzog quote, like all put together. That to me is kind of Mo. <laughs> that, I mean, yeah, in, in all in all fairness, that sums up my my movie interests almost in a T. <laughs> Right. <laughs> yeah, you kidding me? I'll take Klaus Kinski any fucking day. Yeah. You'll have to because no other fucker wanted him. That's that's true. That's absolutely true. But in but in all but in fairness to the movie for what it was as a, a, a you know as a soft core you know uh, not parody of Skinamax. This was a Skinamax movie. Just Straight up. It, it, like maybe maybe not you know appearing on on Skinamax, but this was a Skinamax movie and it was done almost to perfection. That's why, that's why Edge of Sanity is my favorite of the three, because it's the, it's the one that I enjoyed on the basest of levels the most. It was so bad shit crazy. It was yeah. my favorite of the three. Yeah. It was it's just because it was just so crazy. I had to say at least something happened in this one. And not only did something happen, it happened to perfection. <laughs> so right. so I had to lo- I loved it. I loved it. Yeah, I where, where, I'm glad I watched this. Yeah, where, whereas with Terror at London Bridge, that's the movie that I would like to invite people over and watch that again with them because I'd love to see other people's reactions to this. This is the this is the movie that I would want to just smoke a giant fucking bowl and just enjoy <laughs> myself, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, because oh we didn't we didn't do it after the first movie, but um, let's let's quickly do it now so that people might be able to get some kind of idea of how we all feel about it, other than our comments. Uh, so let's quickly go around. D out of five points for Terror at London Bridge. Oh, on a bad movie scale, is actually a three. Okay, and Mo for Terror at London Bridge. On a good movie scale, it's a four. No, I'm. I'm <laughs> Yeah, see, and this and this is the funny part. I actually agree entirely with D. This is this is a bad movie scale three. And uh, I would actually have to say that for a TV movie in which Jack the Ripper inflates out of a stone, uh, I give it not a bad movie three, just a three, just a standard. Like it doesn't. Sure. I mean, listen, it's a TV movie about Jack the Ripper coming out of a stone with David Hasselhoff. Everyone knows going in, it's not a good movie. Like. <laughs> <laughs> but so I give it a three. So now we go on to Edge of Sanity. Um, I give it a two for style, but that's about it. Uh, and uh, D, what what do you give it? Oh God, this may be top five best Skinamax movies I've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> it really what is. Was it, was it I, this? This is Lord of the G Strings. Oh my gosh! <laughs> Wait a minute. There's a Lord of the G Strings. <laughs> yeah, there's a Lord of the G Strings. Yeah, Isn't there a Lord of the G Strings oh. too, as well? Yes, yes, there you is. You know what? You know what? You know what, Mo? Um, this will please you. Me and um, DJ Sue, we are trying to gather as many Skinamax movies as we as we can that we watched as kids. Oh. <laughs> I was going to oh say, if you God. were just trying to compile a list, I could definitely help you with that. But uh, dude, dude, I don't know. You what know what? You're what? I'm, 
I might have to, I might have to, I might have to, we might have to talk to each other because I, there are at least several movies where, because all of them have the same exact plot. So, yeah, like, wait, 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 they work at a modeling agency. Okay, is there a murder subplot? <laughs> okay, okay, I already know this movie. <laughs> well, exactly. what about the, the, the one I remember was a Kira Reed movie called Sex Files that was like a pastiche of the oh X Files. Only yes. there was a, there was yes. an alien I've spore. Seen that. There was an alien spore that came to Earth and made everyone horny. Like, that was the plot of the movie. Yes, the plot of the I movie was it. horny alien spores. Like, that's what they were going for. <laughs> and I'm like, I really don't get this, but okay, let's go with it. You know, I'm like 12 it, it was, or whatever. It was like, oh, uh, it was like, it was like that, that had to be like the first draft of species, and the guy's like, fuck no, throw it away. <laughs> that's what it felt like it was to me. But um, this movie, this movie, oh, um, man, I give it four and a half stars. You four and have and a half to stars, watch how. Fine. You gotta watch how crazy this movie is. It is insane. You, you oh wow, four and a half, four and a half, yeah. See, D, it's interesting because, like, obviously, you got really bored by the first movie, and I kind of enjoyed it. And then the second movie actually made me angry. Like, I actually got <laughs> angry at this film. Uh, like, I really wanted to enjoy it, and I couldn't enjoy it because it made me so angry. So it's interesting that you that we have different opinions on that one. Um, so Mo, what about uh, Edge of Sanity for you, sir? Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, partially agree with D on this one as well. I'm gonna give it a, just a straight four okay. uh, out of five. Yeah, I think this is definitely one that if you're into this style of movie, which is I mean, admittedly, it's very niche, but if you're into this style of movie, I think you'd really enjoy it. Oh, very niche, very so, niche. <laughs> so, all right then, as we got lots of questions that I want to get to at the end of the show, let's race through Bad Karma, because I really don't think there's much to say about this piece of there's shit There's nothing movie. to say about this fucking piece of shit there's movie. Nothing. Except, nothing to say except about this. how did the director of The Legend of Hell House escape to Witch Mountain, Dirty Mary, Mary Crazy Larry and Twins of Evil, and the writer of Hell Comes to Frogtown and Twisted Fate make a movie this fucking awful. Like, how does that happen? Because yeah. you could go, you could go. Oh well, we didn't have a lot of money, but you don't really need a lot of money for what the plot of this story was. Like, the script was fucking abysmal. But essentially, I'm going to boil it down for people who are at all interested. Uh, the, the movie starts with. Like a almost almost pleasing. It does it doesn't quite go there, but it's almost pleasing, ludicrously exploitative and horrendously acted sequence, in which a girl comes to change in a gas station bathroom from her school outfit into what looks like it's going to be either like a nightclubbing outfit and or a hooker outfit because she essentially changes out of her like preppy uh, 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 school clothes into um, like a, a leather skirt and then a bra and then she doesn't get to put any on any other clothes before the guy comes in. But it's it's an incredibly exploitative uh, 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 scene where the guy, the sort of huge hulking greasy gas station attendant is uh, uh, staring at her through a hole in the wall in the bathroom, the biggest gas and the biggest and the cleanest gas station bathroom I've ever seen <laughs> on the planet. Um, yep. Uh, he's looking at her through there. She gets completely naked, so there's bush and breasts and ass and everything in the, in the sequence. Um, and then he comes in uh, and drags her off. Uh, ties her to a bed again, again, completely naked. Um, and uh, he has to continually electrocute her in the most hilariously badly acted naked female electrocution I've ever seen on screen, ever. <laughs> like, they had to, they had to, like... <laughs> They had <laughs> they had to cut it up into like seventy eight shots because clearly they couldn't get one good one of this woman like screaming and vibrating as if she was being electrocuted. So instead, you get this weird montage of her just going like ah, 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 and like almost laughing at some points. So I'm like, what is this? It's really bad. But he does it in order for her to remember that. There used to be someone else in a former life that was sort of part of the Jack the Ripper thing. Like, none of that really makes sense. But, like, he was like, you knew me in a past life. And then he keeps electrocuting her. And suddenly she's, like, back in Jack the Ripper times and goes, oh, I did know you. And then, like, <laughs> breaks away from the bed, uh, kills him and runs off. 
We cut forward years later. She has had uh, plastic surgery to make herself look like the woman she saw in her head that she was in a past life, who was apparently the uh, uh, sort of Jack the Ripper's girlfriend who participated in all the murders, uh, along with Jack the Ripper, uh, back in the 1800s and is now in uh, the early 2000s in a mental hospital in Rhode Island, um, strapped to a bed and played by Patsy Kenza. Um, she is trying to fuck every doctor who comes in the room um, in order to uh, get away from the mental <laughs> institution. It's absolutely true. Um, and uh, she also believes one of her doctors or psychiatrists, who she did actually make out with, um, is actually Jack the Ripper from A Former Life. Uh, it then becomes sort of, I guess a bit like Cape Fear in that she breaks out of the hospital and then chases... I'm sorry, the... a bit? Yeah. A bit like Cape Fear? <laughs> <laughs> well, a bit, a bit like Cape Fear in the sense that she chases down her uh, psychiatrist who she believes has wronged her um, and tries to kill his family. Uh, uh, so a I think bit it's like, like what about Bob personally, but... Right, it's a know. bit like what, it's like a psycho female <laughs> yeah, what about Bob, more, but it's not like Cape Fear. Yeah, it's right. not like Cape <laughs> Fear in the sense that it's fucking awful. <laughs> Uh, it's, like, really bad. So she goes to a, a house where the doctor and his family are living, um, threatens them all, but doesn't actually end up killing anyone except the babysitter. Um, everyone wants to fuck the doctor, even the babysitter. Like, there's even a sequence in the car where he drives the babysitter home for no reason whatsoever. And the babysitter's like, my parents are out. We can go into my house and fuck. And I'm like, what is this movie we're watching? <laughs> like, if they're going to go into the house and fuck, have them go into the house and fuck. But don't have a long sequence where they both get in the car, drive to the house, sit in the car. She says they could do it. And then he goes, no, I'm sorry, I'm married. Like, don't tease me like that. Just fucking <laughs> edit that scene out of the movie. Um, D, D came up with uh, with the greatest nickname for the Doctor character. Oh, yeah. That, the best. You know, it's, the, it's and he's just, so true as well. It's so true. D, go ahead. He is not Rob Lowe. <laughs> <laughs> to a T. It's like, if I wanted yeah. to, it, it is do, he, is dollar, he is dollar store brand <laughs> Rob Lowe. Yeah, yeah, and and no, and no joke. Early <laughs> early two thousands, Patrick Muldoon is absolutely a not Rob Lowe. He he yes. looks he looks like, if you can imagine this hideousness, but Rob Lowe and Jason Patrick had like a night of passion, <laughs> and then and then had like a bland beige ass baby. That is Patrick Muldoon. <laughs> You know what we uh we we uh we uh, always uh at three black geeks we came up with this um term because um there were a bunch of act um female actresses that came out in the two thousands that we couldn't name who they are they were either blonde they were like mostly blonde girls and like oh that's her that's that no 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 we just claimed that that's two that's nineties white girl. That's what we call yeah. it. We just we we did, we use it as a blanket statement. So and that same thing can be said for some of the men, but then you get some of the men who are pretty much clones of other guys. <laughs> and, right. And this guy just so happens to look just like Rob Lowe. <laughs> and not only that, but like there are at least three '90s blonde girls in this movie. Yes, like there just is. generic thing. And what's really frustrating is that one of them is like Amy Locaine, who people might not immediately know that name, but she's in like fucking Cry Baby and Secretary mm -hmm. and like movies that are actually worth fucking watching. And then she's in was, this and piece I was of surprised shit. when I looked her up. I was surprised when I looked her up. I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. You're actually an actor. What are you doing here? And there's fucking <laughs> movies. Like, it, the other two people in the movie, for people who, who don't realize, are Patsy Kensett and Patrick Muldoon, who I, like, Patsy Kensett inexplicably, off the back of the, hands down, the worst performance in any Lethal Weapon movie ever. And let's not forget what Joe Pesci does in some of the Lethal Weapon movies. <laughs> so, like, hands down, the worst performance in any Lethal Weapon movie ever is Patsy Kensett as the South African secretary in, in part two, right? She is so bad in that movie, right? Off the back of that, has managed to have this, like, completely bizarre, straight-to-video, wafting through sleazy, bad rip-offs of, like, A-movies 
um, uh, kind of career. And it's sort of bizarre because you kind of go, oh, Patsy Kenzer did one or two movies. When you look her up, she did tons of this shit. Like, not just one or two bad movies. She did tons. She has yeah, she's 90 got, credits. Yeah, she has 90 credits on IMDb. It's fucking crazy. It's, it's almost, it's almost like you got to think to myself. You got to think to yourself, like, you know what? If she can coast on these kind on the on these movies, why can't well, you know, I wouldn't even say that. I wouldn't say that. That's kind of low on the standard, but at the same time it makes me think she has the same agent as Nicolas Cage because it's like <laughs> I can get you work. I can get you work. All you gotta do is just say yes, okay? <laughs> <laughs> right? All you have to do is say yes. She stars in so many like mad in movies. A lot of them. She stars in a movie that is a Top Gun ripoff with Dirk Benedict. Like, how <laughs> whoa, whoa, the fuck whoa, whoa, does whoa, that whoa. even happen? That's a thing. <laughs> yes. Boy, that movie's real. She That's stars, a real movie. She stars in a Top Gun ripoff. Because I own, like, somewhere on VHS back in the UK somewhere, I own it. Because I was like, Dirk Benedict, this is awesome. I'm trying to find it now, what it's called. It's um, Blue Tornado. It's called Blue Tornado. It came out in 1991. It even has the same fucking Top Gun, like, logo kind of triangle thing with the red stripes behind it. And it's Dirk Benedict Holy and shit. Patsy Kensett in Blue Tornado. Yeah, that is a blatant ripoff. I just looked up the uh, cover art. Like, yeah. that is a blatant fucking ripoff. That's hilarious. Yeah, and the the summary for that movie, uh, which we totally should have watched instead of this film, is right? what, even though Jack the Ripper is in, in it, uh, while experimenting with a new flight maneuver, Colonel Alex Long and <laughs> Phil encounter a mysterious... <laughs> Long, long. <laughs> that first line alone, while experimenting with a new flight maneuver. <laughs> 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 uh, what I love is, Colonel <clears throat> Alex Long and Phil. Like, it doesn't Phil. give Phil's full name. Just oh. Ale- Colonel Alex Long and Phil experimenting and, and the, with a and new and the best, flight. And the best, part, <laughs> the best part, who plays Phil? Ted McGinley. <laughs> Ted McGinley. <laughs> Phil becomes transfixed, flies into the light and disappears. Alex barely manages to come back and is in shock. The remains of Phillips' plane are found later. As inquiries are made, Alex suggests that a UFO could have caused the light. This idea is quickly dismissed. Blah, 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 blah. Patsy Kensett, Alex Long, and Phil. <laughs> The cast in this movie is fucking insane. I mean, yeah. David Warner plays the commander. I mean, yeah. come on. Crap. Now I want to watch the movie. Now I want to watch <laughs> Blue Tornado. Why didn't you pick that one up? But no, well, so, the new blue flight maneuver. <laughs> new flight maneuver. I'm like, what? <laughs> Here's the sad part. Here's the sad part about that. New flight maneuver. What did he do? Did he do a, like a triple loop-de-loop? What? <laughs> what did he not do? No, no, no! He's got Froggy shoot, uh, shouting in his ear. Do a barrel roll. <laughs> oh, you got, and by the you way, if you were ever in doubt why Patsy Kensett was ever even famous in the first place, even her IMDb photo almost has a nip slip, which like just <laughs> fucking explains just exactly why she was famous in the first place. All uh, right, you know David Warner. You know David Warner probably said you're you're a rebel. <laughs> you know he said. Oh, you know he said that. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> But yeah, Holy Patsy, Patsy Kent has got to be watch. one of the worst exports of Britain ever. It's like her and um, who was the other one who was like momentarily famous? She was in uh, like, um, uh, fuck, uh, Elizabeth Hurley, like who was momentarily oh. <laughs> famous and then disappeared into the air. Like two actresses who can't fucking do a single thing right in any oh, movie that they're in whatsoever. Uh, the, the, cl- the closest the closest thing Elizabeth Hurley has had to reclaiming her fame is uh, is the p- pictures she's posting on Instagram right now. Oh really? <laughs> yeah, it's ridiculous. Oh okay, but like uh, yeah, I mean, so uh, Patsy Kenza is in this movie. Uh, it's about uh, again, kind of a time traveling Jack the Ripper thing, or like a kind of reincarnation Jack the Ripper thing. Um, Look, but it's hey, 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 John, John, put it this way. It ain't it ain't Jack the Ripper coming out of a fucking stone. <laughs> <laughs> uh, get it, get it right, get it right. It's a brick. It's a brick. <laughs> a brick. I'm sorry, a brick, sir. You're right. <laughs> Gee, are you honestly telling me that because it's not Jack the Ripper coming out of a brick, that you preferred Bad Karma to to London Bridge? No, I did not. No. Here's the funny thing: because <laughs> you much would have, as have to have... be insane to like this more than London Here's... Bridge. 
<laughs> no, you know what? You know what? Only reason why I liked it is because it did everything I wanted to do because I knew how stupid it was. So, <laughs> it, Mo, Mo, you look. Both of y'all can can relate to this. Have you ever got to a movie where it was doing everything, you, every stupid thing you thought of? You said, like, okay, so. You leave the island and she goes toward you leave the island and she goes toward your family. Thank you. Okay. She kills the guy on the boat. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> but it was you full of like mad shit. Everything. Like she impersonates a police woman. She gets in the car with the with the police guy. Within thirty seconds, she's like, You like me, don't you? And he he's like, Oh, I'm more than like you. And I'm like, how? Like, why? <laughs> How? Like, like, where is that coming from? And yet, it's exactly the same as, like, in that last movie. Um, uh, no, no, it's exactly the same, sorry, as how everyone in this movie wants to fuck the doctor. Like, even the... I, I imagine his daughter, even though she was, like, not of age. I imagine even <laughs> she was looking doe-eyed at Patrick Muldoon or whatever the fuck his name is. Like, it, like every... It was so... Oh, everything in this movie was bad. Like it was, it was not even like it wasn't even fun. Bad. Like it wasn't even inflatable. Wasn't. Uh, 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 Jack the Ripper. Bad. Like it was. There was nothing. I thought the opening sequence with like the full nudity and then the bizarre electrocution. That by the way would not work in any way whatsoever because that's not how electricity works. But anyway, let's just go with that. Um, that whole opening sequence. I thought, well, okay, at least it's going to be some sort of low budget sleaze that I can get behind but there wasn't even like after that opening sequence there wasn't even that it wasn't none of that and the, and what made it worse to me was that everybody was stupid everybody <laughs> everybody, everybody was, was stupid, stupid. Yeah. including everybody us for watching it oh completely oh, yeah, we for us for watching it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. um I and what was all that this, bullshit though? about? Like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna divorce you because you never spend any time with us because you're always at the mental institution. I'm like, why are you trying to throw like a soap opera subplot into this movie? Get with you the can't. killing of the tits already. <laughs> she was like, she was like, we're leaving you if you go back to your job. I was like, okay, you're really not gonna pull this in the middle of. A, you are not going to do this. But you, you know, know it is, it is really funny when he does finally quit his job and like mentions how he's unemployed like. 40 times. 40 times. Like, like, as if any of us give a times. shit. Yeah, like, like, who cares? <laughs> well, I guess I'm unemployed now. I guess I... I guess I, I better I'll... learn guitar again. And what was all that business about? Um, she burns... In the past, we see a flashback. She burns Jack the Ripper alive um, because she believes him to be cheating on her. And then, later on, she in, in modern day, she says, Oh, I know you weren't cheating on me. I knew it was the photograph of your sister. And then he goes, no, actually, I was cheating on you. And I'm like, who cares about any of this? Like, why is, where did any yeah. of this come from? But the, but the best part about that scene was where he inextricably, uh, inexplicably, I should say, um, develops a horrible British accent. <laughs> right. Out of nowhere, he suddenly fucking, yeah, he's, uh, he, uh, he, he, he fucking chimney sweep. Into- yeah, right, right. Yeah, he's he's fucking Dick Van Dyke, uh, Mary Poppins chimney sweeper. <laughs> yeah, he's he's oh, actually he's actually worse than Dick Van Dyke. He's like yeah, he if, is. He's like if Dick Van Dyke's son Barry Van Dyke starred in a <laughs> in a remake of Mary Poppins. Hello, like what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. I was you know ser- I was seriously expecting some Cockney rhyming slang to come out of him. The only um the only thing I have to add on is that it could have been me, or you know I I had to really listen and I had to rewind every time he spoke. But this had to be some of the oh, worst because the, ADR. Because the ADR yeah. was so fucking terrible. Yeah. Oh my gosh! The, the, because the police who was it the police the the the, the, the policeman in the story he sounded like a voice. The policeman and the head psychiatrist both had the same voice actor, and I'm pretty sure I know who the <laughs> no, voice actor is. No, he's not wrong. Is. They absolutely did. It's the yeah. same voice. I think it's the same voice actor. I want to say that Stephen. I want to say that Stephen Blum, but I was like, no, there's no way in the world he would do a movie like this. Even <laughs> even by dub standards, he would not do this movie. Do you know why so it was I, dubbed so bad? Is that it was set in Rhode Island, but it was actually filmed in Island Island. 
So, and you actually heard, like, one of the cops who was trying to do an American accent clearly had, like, you know, he was, like, talking like that and occasionally trying to be American. But then, hello, hello, I'm a little leprechaun. Like, it was <laughs> it was going in, in between the two accents quite wildly. And then others who clearly couldn't do an American accent at all were dubbed by the most boring-sounding American voice actor on the planet ever. Like, Jeff that's why Dull could did be the him. voiceover for <laughs> I was about to say, it could have been him. I knew it could have been him. I was like, wow, this guy sounds too bored to be the person I think it is, man. But wow, I hated that so much. And I think it, was it would Mo, have been more Mo. interesting if Steve Wright had done the voiceover. Like, that's how <laughs> bad it was. I think Mo mentioned it. Mo said, Mo said it reminded him of a Neil Brain movie. I was yeah. like, whoa, 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 whoa. No. No, it's not as bad as a Neil Brain movie. But here's the best part about that: it had better dubbing than a, it had worse dubbing than a Neil Brain movie. Oh no, no, yeah, no, the no. ADR no. in a Neil Brain movie is way better than this. Absolutely, <laughs> I would watch every Neil Bre- Neil Breen film again before I even watched this. Uh, uh, oh my uh, gosh! Even contemplated watching this again. I literally have nothing else to say about this movie. I, have I mean, nothing like, else to say. like the movie has two good scenes: the scene at the beginning with the with the tits and electrocution because it's hilarious, and the scene where Patrick Muldoon all of a sudden uh, develops a British accent. Yeah, um, and and that's and that's really it. Yeah, and all I wanted him to say was "Cool, blimey, Mari right, right, Poppins." Right, exactly, yeah. you know. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean it was it was an absolute piece of shit movie. And again, like what I tried to do because I hadn't seen any of these films. The only one I'd even heard of in the lead up to this was Edge of Sanity, which I'd at least heard of because it uh, got a Blu-ray release. But like, um, I, I wasn't aware of any of these other movies. What I tried to do was I tried to look up Jack the Ripper movies that were made with like by Americans with like an American take on Jack the Ripper. Um, and I tried to find movies that were like completely weird and like had an interesting take on the Jack the Ripper thing. And from well, the from the game. Well, congratulations. Well fucking correct congratulations. Well, they, no, no, but they that. all have they all have one is Jack the Ripper inflates himself from a brick. The second <laughs> one, Jack the Ripper is also Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. And in the third one it's like reincarnated flashback Ripper. So like at least it's at least my intentions were good. Like, at least it, they all had interesting premises. The fact that right, right. none of them did anything <laughs> with that premise is not my fault. I was actually and surprised when I, when I mentioned that I was watching Terror at London Bridge, um, how many people had commented on that, saying that they had been wanting to see this. So, you know, I mean, uh, of the three that I watched, that's the one that the the most of my friends who admittedly all have very weird taste in movies um have had the most interest in watching who knows i might have somehow magically tapped into a very early strain of the zeitgeist that's suddenly going to bring this movie back from the dead i don't know <laughs> I, um, I, I would actually love to do screenings of uh, of terror at london bridge because i think i think big audiences audiences of people who are in the know would have a blast watching this movie on a on yes a, they would a, yes, I mean ha- would. Hasselhoff's performance it of all Hasselhoff performances before he became try, before he tried rather to become a self parody um, and still failed at that um, of <laughs> all his earnest performances where he genuinely thinks he's doing good work but he's doing absolutely horrendously bad work this is like this blew my mind how like ridiculous he's being in this movie. Right. Right. And it was kind of a joy. So, uh, let us wrap up. Thanks ever so much, fellas. First of all, for uh, watching those films, I can't thank you enough. I know they were a slog to get through, but I think, uh, we pulled it out and, uh, made it, uh, an enjoyable conversation and a funny uh, conversation. Honestly, honestly, I only felt that bad karma was the slog. I thought yeah. I, the rest, you know, the, the only one that I complained about watching was Bad Karma. The the other two I really enjoyed, so I had no problem bad, watching. Bad Karma at all. was only eighty five minutes long, and I fell asleep through twenty minutes of it. <laughs> I had to rewind and watch twenty minutes of like I was actually like watching it through, like you might flip through a book, like speed reading or whatever, right, like right. speed watching it. And I was like, oh, really? So nothing happened in that twenty minutes I missed then? Because yeah. like I woke up later, I was like, I know exactly what's going on. It ended, and then I went back to watch the middle twenty minutes. I was like, yeah, fuck all happened. She just showed up on the island. You know Nothing what? happened. Like, nobody cares. 
I will admit, I will admit, if I did see Tara at London Bridge with probably like a friend, and we're just sitting there, just you know, like taking shots at it, it would have been, you know, I would have probably had a whole lot of money, uh, you know, a lot more fun with it. I will admit mm-hmm. that. And when it came to bad karma, yeah, I I totally zoned out. I would think I was like doing other stuff on the computer. I wasn't even looking at the movie. <laughs> it was just so bizarre how the beginning was, was so R rated. And then the rest of the movie was so vanilla, like it, like it completely was. It was amazing how how dull it was. And also, I I, I failed to mention the turn the turn of the two thousands. Terrible rock music that was in it. (laughs) I I also have to say thanks, Dee, because you did sit through (laughs) three movies, which now that I think about it were all white casts. I can't think of, I can't <laughs> think of one about, single brother thing. in any of those movies at all. <laughs> Here's the funny thing. Here's the funny thing about that, John. I'm, I'm so John, that's to... your white guilt talking. <laughs> that's your white guilt I'm talk, suddenly talking. thinking yeah. about these movies, and I'm like, there literally was no black actors no in any of these people. Films. No black people at all, because first off, in Bad Karma, if, it, if there was at least one black person in there, all right, you better, you better, you better lock up that crazy bitch now. <laughs> Everybody, there would have been somebody saying something but anyway i don't care i don't care i i've seen the whitest of the whitest of the movies you know it doesn't matter to me no, <laughs> so no, it, i know it, no it, i know it, i was just really making the joke just because i suddenly was sat there going was it well, you even know, for character? Not even, you know what i thought for two seconds the first hooker that was in um <laughs> <laughs> I thought she was like mixed, it, like she was like you know half black, half white maybe, but you know it didn't even matter to me. <laughs> but, um, but, you know, it was no it was did. just it was just funny. Uh, but yeah, so uh, let's answer up some questions uh, very yeah. quickly. So uh, my co-host Jim Wallace asks, "Who's the best Jack the Ripper out of these three movies, and who would you ultimately cast as Jack the Ripper in a movie you were making if you could?" Um, so, uh, Mo, do you want to go ahead with that first question? Uh, well, I made a joke on his comment where I said, uh, you know, the remakes are all right, but I prefer the original. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, I don't know. As, as far as, uh, as far as casting it, um, uh, I don't know, Pauly Shore, maybe. Pauly Shore. But no, the best, the best Jack the Ripper out of these three movies, we all out agree, right, is Perkins, right? He's the best. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. 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 That's, clearly, that's clearly, not clearly even a question. That's yeah. not even a question. And, uh, who would I cast as Jack the Ripper if I could? Um... Yahoo Serious? Tim Roth. Tim Roth as Jack the Ripper would actually be really, really good. <laughs> yeah. You know what? Tim, Tim Roth know. as Jack the Ripper and Gary Oldman as Sergeant Abilene. And Ooh. I would flip it because you would expect Oldman to play the bad guy and Roth to play the detective. I would flip it. I'd have Roth as Ripper and, and Oldman as Abilene. That would be my ultimate Jack the Ripper movie. Um, I think I if I was answering the question seriously, <laughs> I, uh, I I think um, I mean I would go super sleazy with it though, of course and, you would. <laughs> and, and yeah, I mean obviously, and I like and go really American with it too. So I think I think the perfect combination of Ripper and the detective who's going after him, and I don't care which one plays which because both would do a, fan, a fantastic job. Uh, Tom Sizemore. Um, as either, I don't care who, as long as he says motherfucker at least once. Right. And, uh, and in the other role, Michael Madsen. Nice. Um, and just for my friend Jim, because I know uh, he would love this idea, but if you were going to do more of a big budget American kind of like style, glossy Jack the Ripper, Sam Neill as Jack the Ripper. Just putting it out there. Uh, D, a, uh, what would, what would your choice be, man? And there are so many. There, you know, I would. It it would matter. It would matter what type of tone we have. Is if it's going to be like serious and all that, I would actually have to sit down. I would actually have to sit down or actually go through a whole lot of British actors because I'm one of those. I'm one of those people. If we're going to do it, let's do it right. <laughs> like, nice. you know, like, let's get it down to the time and all that. You know, um, I wouldn't really know. I wouldn't know. I wouldn't know. I would get somebody that you would not expect. Actually, if anything, I would probably redo Edge of Sanity and, and in so many words, do it right. And right. Just they did sure. it right, D. <laughs> <laughs> the trouble is, D, is nowadays they the would cast is. like fucking Ryan Gosling or Tom Hardy or some no, fucking no, no, asshole. No, no, no. See, that's the problem. If See, they made the it now. I, 
because I like Tom Hardy, and that would be the first person to say, I'm like, no, 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 Tom no, Hardy, no. Tom Hardy plays no, Jack no, the no. Ripper and the detective. <laughs> Adam, oh, would not... <laughs> Adam Driver is Jack the Dripper because he's so fucking uh, wet. That's pretty funny. Sorry. <laughs> Carry on, Dave. What do you say? I wouldn't know. Actually, I'm being honest. I really, I really don't know who I would pick to be Jack the Ripper. But I would, if if anything, I would redo Edge of Sanity. I would redo it, just do different stuff. And and but um, God, man, I wouldn't know. I don't know. I don't know because I. <laughs> well, Tobey Maguire. Toby Maguire. He's already done it. Toby Maguire already problem. did it in Spider Man 3. So just cast Toby <laughs> Maguire again. I think he'll problem. grow into the role. <laughs> the one problem I do have with it when it, when I pick an actor is like, no, he's too pretty. He's too pretty. He's too pretty. Benedict he Cumberbatch is. He can't act. He <laughs> too, oh, they so cast Cumberbatch <laughs> in this <laughs> fucking movie. They do that. Oh, you know that what? You know, drippy, pale bastard. They would do it. They would do it, and I will say no. Please, God, no. Please, no. don't, don't do it. Don't I'd, do it. Fuck, I'd rather they cast fucking Simon Pegg than fucking Benedict Cumberbatch. Uh, anyway, no Simon might do it right. Mo- <laughs> mo- might. Moving on to Mark McDonald's question: uh, Do you prefer fictionalized accounts like these movies, or attempts at a more historically accurate portrayal of figures uh, like the you Ripper? Have to make it fictional. You so have like, to make it fictional, like serial killer films. So. Like, he likes Zodiac and stuff, but, like, um, which I love Zodiac as well, but uh, I don't really watch Zodiac as... No, I mean, I suppose it is factual, but it's also pretty fictional as well, I think, the interpretation. No, you have to make it as fictional as possible. You know, I don't think I don't think authenticity would, would you know... Would oh, I got it. I got it, guys. Better. Danny Trejo is... <laughs> <sighs> I got scared. I was going to say Danny Trejo. I really thought you were going to say Danny Trejo being stalked by Danny DeVito. Danny DeVito is the detective. And Danny Trejo is the... Danny Trejo is a hooker. He's like, he's coming up the street, man. In a hot pink fucking ballerina outfit. <laughs> and he's all like, oh ooh la God, la. Would, would you pay, like a good time? I would pay all the money in the world to see that. <laughs> and Danny Trejo as the hooker in. Man, Danny ain't saying no to shit so, anymore. So you're saying you're <laughs> saying the weirder and the wilder and the more fictional, the better for you, D. Me personally, me personally, yeah. The more weirder, and that's what what I liked about Edge of Sanity so much that it it was like. You know what? We're gonna do Jack the Ripper, but fuck it. Let's let's throw in uh, Jack and Hyde in there. And also, hey, take this cane, put it on that girl's pussy. Let's see where we go with this. <laughs> <laughs> let's see if we can't get really weird. Um, the, see, weirdly enough, one of my favorite Jack the Ripper movies of all time, apart from the fucking horrible um, acting of Heather Graham, is From Hell. Because I think what From Hell does so well is that it tells a fictional story. Um, but it does it within the parameters of all the facts that they do know about the case. And that's what yeah. I really, really loved about the movie. Plus, put Robbie Coltrane in fucking anything, and it's wonderful, except that Harry was Potter. Actually, you know what? When I think about that, that was actually, oh God, one of probably two Jack the Ripper movies I've seen, and that was a really good one. Yeah, I It is. From Hell's that. really good, apart from Heather Graham's acting. But, like, all the other stuff about From Hell is based, like, they actually, on the, the double disc, they actually have this big documentary about Jack the Ripper with one of, like, these weird, nerdy ripologists who knows all the fucking different different suspects and blah 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 and what happened and stuff and he actually goes through with photographs and descriptions and everything going like this is how well set up these crime scenes were in the movie like that movie is as close to how the crime scene would have looked like they were really weirdly meticulous in kind of putting it together now the story itself is all sort of made up but it is made up from like there are conspiracy theories that are very close to that story, just without the fantasy element that it has at the end of it. Um, and so, like, that's one of my favorites in terms of setting, direction, cast, and everything else. Um, so I like that it was kind of 
fictionalized but had like a factual backing to the fiction that's what i liked about it because i'm a big mm-hmm. conspiracy nut fan of like <laughs> no i i'm not a conspiracy nut myself but i love like movies about conspiracies and conspiracy nuts like that i just like mad conspiracies um hey. all right so mike merriman asks uh do you feel mis marketing films is becoming too common especially for the horror genre um Guys, I'll throw it out to you guys. Do you think All right, I, I got, films is I got true? this one. All right, so Michael Sarah as Jack. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, We've moved on from that question, though. <laughs> it, we, we get the full on mumblecore Noah Baumbach. <laughs> no, I'm Fuck. kidding. Um, well, I'm sorry. What was the yeah. question? I'm sorry. I was Where's waiting for that this whole time. Jack the Ripper. <laughs> Dee, what, dee, uh, dee, dee, with with soundtrack by Nico and the Velvet Underground. <laughs> <laughs> what was the question again? <laughs> the the question was for fuck's sake, Mo. Do you feel mis marketing films is becoming too common, especially for the horror genre? I don't think horrors are really mis marketing. I think most horror films these days are terrible and they're pretty badly marketed as well. Yeah. Um, right. I so, see that way more. I see that I see mismarketing done way more in action films yes. uh, than than anything else. Like uh, there's a lot of them out there that uh, that are really good, and I feel like the marketing team drops the ball on it big time and and portrays the film in such a. Di- I mean, I think a great example, and I think me and you, John, have actually talked about this before, is that film Spy. Yes. Uh, no, where they they. Sure. You know, the, the marketing behind that movie is that, oh, she's inept. She doesn't know what she's doing. Meanwhile, like that movie could have been for for uh, strong female leads, what they were trying to do with the Ghostbusters movie. Completely. You know, and, and like she knew exactly what she was doing. She was badass as fuck through the whole fucking movie. And it was, and that whole entire movie is super fun. Uh, as far as horror movies is concerned, no, I agree with you. I don't think they're, I don't think there's a lot of mismarketing at all. Their movies that are coming out are just shit. Yeah, and, yeah and then, that, I was going to say the exact same thing. That's really what it falls on. Is yeah. that it ain't so much that they're mismarketed. It's just that they build up this. Oh, it's going to be the scariest thing in the world. You know what? I have to be. I have to be honest. It's almost on the same level of a athlete where they say I'm the best. What you think that athlete is going to say I'm the worst thing in the world? No, you're trying to sell the movie. So of course you're going to say, oh, this is the scariest movie of all time. Of course we all know that's going to be bullshit. But <laughs> but. But hey, they, that's the way they market it. So I don't think it's really that big of a problem with horror movies. And I have to agree with Mo. It's more on the action side where they mess mm. up. Gerard Depardieu. As, <laughs> as. <laughs> uh, so, so that's it. And the last question from uh, Mike Merriman is, is Doug Tilly correct in his assessment that Eric Roberts is the fucking man? <laughs> I I have to recuse myself from this question because if I answer it wrong, <laughs> Doug will actually kill me. Uh, Eric Roberts has always been the fucking man, so there's <laughs> no way I can get around that. Yeah, I mean, I'll 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 say yes, although I I don't quite know what the evidence is for that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I, I, and and. By the way, all three of these movies, if people remember the sleazy Spader springtime that we did, all three of these movies is worse than Jack's back, even though that doesn't quite uh, explain the whole Jack the Ripper thing. Um, each one of these movies is worse <laughs> than Jack's back. Um, I'm trying to think. I thought we got another question uh, in the group, but I'm not seeing it. Um, I, I, got, I got it, guys. Tony Shalhoub is Jack uh, the Ripper. <laughs> Here's the sad have part I, about Have it. I officially I worn this joke that. out yet? <laughs> no, 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 no. Here's the funny thing, Mo. I think but, you just hit Pater. I think I mean, you just I hit Pater. I may have just hit Pater because think about that, it. He's a, that sounds he's good. a thoroughly unassuming looking guy who could blend in if necessary and could probably, I mean, I don't know. I don't think I've ever seen him portray Sinister that often, but I, I mean, he's a good actor. He could probably do it. Look, look, just give him, just, just make sure there's like a problem with him. 
I like I don't know anything. Like, <laughs> right, right. Jim would I mean, have not... a major issue with Shalhoub. Uh, Jim is not a, a fan of the Shalhoub. We had a whole anti Shalhoub rant from Jim uh, a couple of years back on the podcast. I don't quite know what Tony Shalhoub has done to Jim, but like somewhere along the line, he rubbed him up the wrong way. That's weird. You know, you know. Uh, <laughs> no, I don't think physically. <laughs> No, 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 I just know what I meant. <laughs> I just meant it's like of all people, why Tony Shalhoub, you know? Right, okay. I found, I, found, I found the other questions, guys. We've got to uh, wrap this up. But um, So uh, Jim asks, is James Spader of Jack's Pack that I just mentioned an exact cross between Anthony Perkins, the like kind of sleazy grease level, and David Hasselhoff? Huh. No. No. Uh. I don't think so. Yeah. I know where Jim is coming from. I understand, like, the sleaziness and the cheesiness come together to make, like, a kind of glorious spadiness, but uh, I, I'm not sure about that. Um, no, 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 no. This, this, this doesn't have nothing of spader in it. That's the problem about it. And plus, Anthony Perkins is straight up, you know, on cocaine, so that's different. <laughs> <laughs> William Shatner is. No, uh, so anyway. Um, Forrest Whitaker is. For, Forrest Whitaker Forrest, is Lazy look, 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 look. Eye Jack. Uh, <laughs> if you made Forrest Whitaker, if you made Forrest Whitaker, Jack the Ripper, you are not is going to be on the same level of acting as Anthony Perkins. It's going to surprise <laughs> you. Absolutely, it would be. It would yeah. be amazing, especially if you told him he got bagels as a as a reward. <laughs> The man's a carbaholic. What can you the say? The man loves a bagel. Uh, Kirk Howley asks, does America have its own unsolved mystery as compelling as the Jack the Ripper case? I can think of the Zodiac Killer as one example. Any others? And would they make interesting films? Or is there something about Jack the Ripper that touches on just the right formula? I think the whole think thing with Jack the Ripper, like back in the day, is the, you know, the smoky, foggy streets of old London town. Like, I think that's kind of, you know, there's a guy in the mist killing... Hookers. I think it has like death, sex, and old London. It has like all the yeah, things people honestly, love. Honestly, if, if I mean, I don't know. I I don't know what what would necessarily compare American wise to that. Um, but whatever it is, it would have to take place like in 1970s New York. It would have to. Right. Yeah. In order to do it, in order to do it the way you want it to be, it would have to be play, take place in New York. The only one we have close to that is probably uh, Black Dahlia. The Black Dahlia case, that's probably the only one we have Maybe. close to it. Maybe, but that's only, I mean, that was only one death. Yeah, yeah, that was only one death. I forgot, that was only one death. Yeah, see, I don't know that. So, yeah, you can you can easily make some type of murder mystery, but it would have to be, like, in New York, or it has to, New York, maybe Chicago, where you can have this, like, is. It's isolation. You like you like. There's a lot of people, but there's like isolation. You're there's still parts where you're alone. You feel there. You feel this loneliness, and right, there's right. somebody stalking you. Right. I think that well, it work. needs to be. It needs it to be. A, it needs to be a scenario. It needs to have a location where the location is a character as well. You know, because yeah. like because old London is a character. Like right. it, it yes, is. Yes. You know, and 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 old school like seventies New York is a character without yes, it a doubt. Yeah, and I think I think as I said before, like what what lends itself to the story is that you know, it's it's needlessly grotesque. Like he removes right. organs and you yeah, know, yeah. there's there's little mysteries like was he a surgically trained person because of the way that the certain uh, hookers were killed. The fact that he's killing hookers in general, like there's just there's so much wrapped up in the real story that is like cinematic and and sleazy that to kind of try and find an American version of that, I don't. I I think that if it existed, we would have all heard about it. And I and mm. I off the top of my head, I can't think of one because even Zodiac is not. Uh, like Zodiac is is kind of like scary, and certainly the the movie and the story and everything is really well done and things like that. But it's not like insidious and sleazy and removing organs and weirdness. You know what I mean? Right, right. Um, Robert Ginty is Jack the Ripper. Oh my God, I would love a Ginty <laughs> Ripper movie. Can you oh, no, no, here we go. Here, a Ginty here we go. This, Ripper movie. This one's for John. Steven Seagal is. <laughs> oh, fuck no. Right. You know we've you we've know officially... No. Slap, slap the Ripper. No. We've <laughs> Jack the Slapper. Jack the Slapper. Oh, flap hands. Like, I'm Jack the Flapper. I'm going to slap you, Johnny. I'm going to flap you around the movie. Hey, big uh, boy, you want to go me? Yeah, I think I do. Uh, 
Yeah, Putin is. Uh, and Steven Seagal is the detective. Um, so anyway, last question, absolute last question, then we've really got to say goodbye to this wonderful, wonderful show. Uh, but um, uh, Steve, uh, from the um, Everything I Learned from Movies podcast, uh, which you can find at E-I-L-F Movies on Twitter, he asks about a very strange movie that I haven't heard of, but I wondered if you two guys have. Have, have you guys heard of Cold Moon, which is a movie that apparently is coming out today and features Tommy Wiseau, Christopher Lloyd, and Frank Whaley, directed by the director of Arachnoquake. No. No, I know. No, the fact that you said Christopher Lloyd and Tommy Wiseau, and I heard <laughs> nothing of it, and especially I have a... No, here's the funny thing. I have a, I have a friend. He, like, follows everything Wiseau does. He hasn't mentioned one thing, especially Christopher Lloyd. So well, look at I that right there. I've got to track it down and watch it now, uh, even though I find the, the sort of mythos of Wiseau very uh, irritating and annoying and hipster. Um, I, uh, yeah, I will I, probably still track it down. Yeah, I get I get irritated by by the whole thing that's happening with that now, because like, I mean, I remember, you know, going to the theater, seeing the room and, you know, with with a crowd of people who are kind of in the know. And it was a fun little like cult experience. And now it's just turned into this big thing. And I'll probably see the disaster artist if I'm being completely honest. But oh, you know, I I, I'm, 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 I'm a little am. Yeah, I'm a little. I definitely am. I ain't gonna fake. I really. I'm a little over. I've been waiting for this. I've been waiting for this. All right. <laughs> All right. One. One last one. Luis Guzman. Is. <laughs> <laughs> and um, Cheech Marin. Yeah. Cheech Marin is. <laughs> I tell you what. If you're gonna do an American one. Jeff Fahey, you can't quite go wrong. And like when you're talking Honestly, about that, actually would be really good casting. Is Eric Roberts the fucking man? No, sure. Jeff fucking Fahey is. That's I'm yes. going to end it on that bombshell. <laughs> so thanks, guys. Thanks very much for doing the podcast. Uh, it's been wonderful. It's been a thrill. It's been a pleasure. Uh, D, why don't you tell uh, the men's and the misses where they can find you? Well, I'm on Three Black Geeks. Just type in Three Black Geeks, all one word. The number three Black Geeks. Just throw it into Google. Trust me, you will find everything. Our YouTube page, our archive of our podcast. Um, currently, right now, we're doing um, horror, you know, just doing uh, quote unquote horror movies, and it might not be horror movies. Um, last month, we just got done with, with When Animals Attack, AKA when White People Fuck With Nature. So, <laughs> so, so we just got done. <laughs> And, and, and I, know what you're gonna, I know what you're going to say. Like, wait a minute, but one of those is bird dimming. Don't worry. We blame global warming on white people. Don't ask, don't ask questions. We already fine. Did. Blame everything <laughs> on white people. That's kind of where we're at right now. We kind of, kind of where we're at. But, uh, but, uh, no, but, but it's I, kind of uh, true. Like, that's what happens if you've been in power for hundreds of thousands but, of years. But, but, but that being said, but that being said, uh, just type in Three Black Geeks. You can find our, like I said, you can find our YouTube page. You can find our, um, and, um, our, our, our podcast archive page, our Twitter page, all of that. So um, just go ahead. There you go. Do it because it's awesome. Thanks so much for being on the show, D. Mo, <laughs> uh, I know you're not doing anything like routinely right now, but where can people well, find doing, you? Doing no budget nightmares. Um, oh, well, no budget nightmares. Of course. Sorry. That, yeah. That's always going uh, on. We got, uh, the, we, got the big, we got the big 100th episode coming up. Uh, it only took us six years to get there. Nice. Um, well done. Where, whereas anybody else following our schedule uh, would have done it in four. So that's that's good. Um, it's actually uh, a big, big thing. Uh, we have four huge, well, three huge and one unexpected interview uh, lined up for for our listeners. Uh, I, I have talk. not been asked to be on the show, so it can't be that fucking good. <laughs> John, John has, yeah, John has uh, has not been on since episode ten. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> we are now at episode hundred. Yeah. Uh, but of course, that being said, we don't have anybody on ever really. So this, I think, this is only the second or third time we actually had uh, people other than me and Doug on the show because me and Doug are uh, on your thirtieth narciss- episode. You had people write in and send stuff in. Right, right, yeah. So you were on episode 10. We did our 30th episode spectacular, which was just some random number that we decided deserved to be recognized. And now we're doing episode 100. Um, 
uh, yeah, it's it's going to be big. It's it's I, when I mean big, I mean it's going to be a ridiculously long episode, but like probably like four and a half hours. But yeah, you can find us on Facebook, uh, facebook.com slash group slash no budget nightmares, uh, all one word. Uh, or you can find our archive on no budget podcast.com. Follow me on Twitter. I'm drunk at VHS or Doug, who is not currently here at Doug underscore Tilly. That's T I L L E Y. Um, and not that's that about- he needs any more fucking promoting. Come on, no, he doesn't. But you know, you get into the the, into the groove of saying that whole thing every time. Um, Doug yeah, Tilly, who I- is interviewing Eric Roberts live on stage, like that's I'm, insane. I'm so excited about the possibilities that that might open up for No Budget Nightmares to do something similar. You know, in the same in the same sort of idea. I don't know if it'll actually happen, but it would be super cool. Like, honestly, like our dream um, is to do a screening of science crazed and to do like a little panel discussion afterwards with like me and Doug and maybe Josh Johnson or something like that. You know, know I have, we have a similar um, goal too. our goal is actually, Oh my gosh, this is a movie that never came out. It was a dance movie called boogie town. And I am not lying to you when I tell you this, Think of Romeo Must Die, but sure. it's dancing involved, and and I'm not lying about this. Everybody has Dragon Ball Z type powers. <laughs> that sounds <Wow>. amazing. <laughs> it never came out. It was the same people who made um. Uh, it was that the same people like who double made Dragon all. almost, but yeah. Right? Actually, you know what? It probably it, 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 we won't never know because it was never released. It was never released. There's only a trailer on YouTube and was supposed to come out, I think it was supposed to come out like 2010 and it never came out. Our dream is to tra- is to track down the filmmaker, make and get a whole lot of people to basically say release the movie and we have a screener for it. We, yeah, right. I, I really, man, it's the perfect bad movie. We already know it's bad. We already know it's bad. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, dude, that sounds to me like the last dragon meets the double dragon. Like, that's what that sounds to me like. I can only presume that at some point, Robert Patrick with dyed blonde hair shows up. Like, I can just assume that at some point. No, actually, yeah, I mean, and, and Robert to me, Patrick not... showed up, that would improve the movie. That would actually improve the movie, so yeah. <laughs> I mean, and as far as, like, pop culture implications are concerned, I mean, that could be, like, the next, like, Miami connection or something to that effect. Oh, my gosh. I think the only reason why he didn't release it is because the people that's in it is, um, gosh, um, the, the stars that are in it are actually R&B singers. And I think the reason why it never came out was because that will probably just – destroy their careers even though <laughs> even though ironically even though ironically nobody has an album out ever since then so it didn't even matter <laughs> so. it will just retroactively stop their greatest hit sales uh okay so uh with that guys thanks ever so much this has been an epic after movie diner podcast uh, and a thoroughly enjoyable one hopefully i'll try and get this up by monday uh tuesday at the very latest but thanks so much uh, for being in on this, guys, and uh, let's do it again soon. All right. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Anytime. All no the best. Problem. All right. <laughs> Spooks Spooks and trolls are just a myth. So says my psychiatrist. Ghosts and goblins don't exist. He keeps telling me. Ghosts I see are always sad Boo hoo Everybody thinks I'm mad Tonight we'll sure there'll be no sleep for you As long as we keep saying Boo Ghosts drop in to say hello Through the walls they come and go Here comes my old mate Banquo it's freezing on the heat. It's very parky. The ghosts I see are always sad. Ooh. Everybody thinks he's mad. Tonight we're sure there'll be no sleep for you. As long as we keep saying, Ooh. Why?
And wandering around the streets, they wait until you're half asleep, and then they wake you up. Boo! The ghosts I see are always sad. Boo! Everybody thinks he is mad. Tonight we're introducing Hamlet's dad with half a pint of poison in his ear. Roll. Boop, 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 boop. 